has control of this bank of rents? Uh, I did, I see over there, but do you know which one? I don't, it, are they behind Brian there? I don't know. They're right. That's good. Much better. Good morning, folks. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Dave Milan with the the Economic Development Director in Bucksport, and we're um, going to start off our the series for you know uh, creating your business plan, and uh, uh, we're we're certainly we're very happy to you know to have you here today. I know we had a um, we had several people that uh, have signed up for it, so I kind of half expect some people <coughs> to be kind of flowing in as the uh, as the morning goes on. That says, oh crap, I forgot we had that this morning, didn't we? So. Um, we'll uh, we'll see uh, see where it goes. Um, when the, when the, the the mill announced that they were going to be closing, uh, Eastern Maine Development Corporation had uh, conducted a survey of uh, of the workers to find out what kind of services that uh, that they thought that they'd be needing for uh, um, for uh, as they transition on with the with the you know kind of the rest of their life. So. And uh, um, one of those things that was was brought that w the got a really high response back was um, whether people who were interested in learning more about how to start their own business. And so we felt that we needed to uh, be able to help provide that those services um, as we as we move forward. But at the same time, we said let's let's deal with the the more important things first, and we'll deal with this kind of in the spring. So spring's here, and here we're at. We said, look, if we're going to do this, let's open it up to the whole community. So there are some of you that are here um, that may have been affected uh, directly by the uh, the mill, some indirectly by the mill, um, and others are just uh, you know are members of the community are, are interested in taking the the this opportunity to uh, to learn more about how to how to create your own your own business. And so what we have decided to, to do was to create this, um, this uh, series that would allow you to uh, create your own business plan um, for your business. Uh, your business plan is, is uh, you're, really, you, you're going to hear more about uh, throughout this whole series is why business plans are important. Um, but uh, typically, you do a business plan for one of two reasons. One, you need to get your, your, your project funded. Um, or two, you're trying to plan for the you know the future of the business. Um, unfortunately, for most businesses, the first one seems to be more important. When in fact, the second one is definitely uh, much more important. You really need to be able to plan um, for the you know the future of your of your business. So as you're as you're going through, you're going to be learning a lot of things about this uh, about the you know the business plan and, and the creation of it. Uh, the the what we hope that uh, you're going to be uh, interested in doing as well is is that the culmination of this of this whole program um, will be a business plan pitch um, where you'll be you know you'll be competing with your business plan with uh, with uh, with your other classmates to uh, um, to uh, for cash uh, and service awards um, that uh, will help you uh, kick off that business as well because my goal as the economic <laughs> development director. Uh, is uh, I'd like to see every single one of you decide to you're going to go on and, and start your own business here um, and uh, and be successful at it. And we think that by the proper planning um, that you, your that will increase those you know, your chances of that of that uh, uh, you know of that uh, of that success. First of all, I want to say that um, the we couldn't do uh, these these series if we didn't have the help with um, the quality businesses in the area anyway to help sponsor it. And, and today, uh, each one of these events, as we go on for the next six weeks, each one of those, um, these, the costs associated with doing these are sponsored uh, by one of our uh, one of our businesses. And today, uh, it, today's session um, is being uh, is sponsored by the Seaboard Federal Credit Union. And Dan Kelly is here. He's going to come up and, and take a few minutes to talk about um, the the credit union and, and what it can do. Uh, the services that they have that can help you as you move forward with your your business decisions. So, Dan. Well, thank you uh, for coming. It's good to be here. Um, I'm Dan Kelly. I'm the CFO and the Vice President of uh, Seaboard Federal Credit Union. And um, on the way over here, I was thinking about you know one reason why a lot of you are here because of the changes in town and stuff. And next week, Seaboard celebrates its 75th anniversary. 
And part of our notes we're gathering for that is uh, looking at the changes in, in our business. And when Seaboard first opened, the maximum unsecured loan you get was $50, and the maximum secured loan is $250. And I guess the point is, if we never change our business plan, um, we wouldn't be doing much business now. Uh, $250 doesn't get you much. So it is exciting when, when well, not really exciting the mill closed, obviously, but when things change, there are opportunities. We know some people will start businesses, small businesses. Um, uh, now statistically, you've probably seen that about half businesses fail within the first four years. I'm a little bit of an optimist. I prefer to think that means half the businesses make it, you know, so it, you can look at it that way. But one of the biggest reasons they say it fails is for lack of planning or uh, not understanding a part of the business. Maybe not the exact business that you do, but maybe like not paying sales tax, not knowing about workman's comp, anything like that. That's, that's usually why they do fail. Now, obviously, Seaboard does offer financing both for personal and for business purposes. Um, Startup self-employed businesses is one of the more difficult businesses to finance because they do have a, a high um, uh, default rate. Um, we do SBA and um, FAME loan as well as other products. But the, one of the first things we'll <coughs> ask you if you do decide that you need finance and want to come to the credit union is let's see your business plan. And what the business plan really does for us is it, it tries to show us that you guys know what you're talking about. We're supposed to be the expert in lending. You're supposed to be the expert in your business. So we don't care if we know how to make a widget as long as you can prove to us that you know how to do that. And um, one of the problems we see, a lot of people come in, they, they want to do, uh, apply for a loan. And you mentioned a business plan, and they want us to write it for them or help them with it. The problem with that is we can't. In other words, there's lender liability issues that we have to rely on what you're telling us, and we see try to determine if it makes sense from that. Um, we'd love to be able to sit down and help you do it, but we just can't do that. So. Hopefully um, you enjoy these, um, these sessions. Um, I've looked at the topics, I think they're great. Financing one's my favorite, of course. <laughs> but um, hopefully uh, for those of you that uh, do decide to go into business, if you have a financing need, I hope you'll consider the credit union. Thank you and enjoy your session. And as always, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't at least kind of give you the, the, the ground rules or the, the lay of the land here anyway, is, is that uh, the, the, the session today is from, is from uh, 9 to 11. Um, the, the, uh, it's a, the, a lot of information, frankly, that we're trying to uh, squeeze into a, 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 uh, into a small bag, but uh, we're, so uh, timing is of, of uh, essence want to just let you know that like I said there are our refreshments out in the hallway there's uh, water out there there's coffee out there if there are other things that you'd like for me um, to uh, to provide you short of uh, you know a lobster dinner um, uh, let me know uh, which as this goes forward I want to make sure that you know, that you folks are comfortable as we're going through these events as well out the hallway and uh, to the left around the corner are the restrooms um, so if you if uh, during these presentations uh, the the speakers again they're getting trying to get a lot of information in a short period of time so there's not uh, a lot of breaks so if you if you uh, have the need they understand you can you know they don't uh, think that you're uh, running out on them you can you know go to the you know use the restrooms and such so um, any other um, yeah the uh, uh, yes. <laughs> As 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 uh, a speaker once told me, that's uh, you know you can uh, join me in a moment of silence and uh, turn our phones off. Um, so uh, th it would certainly help to uh, um, as uh, as things move forward. This whole um, this whole uh, uh, series has has been a culmination of a lot of people you know coming together, uh, and there's a lot of people you're seeing in the in the room today that are here that really want to help you and and be able to to work. Um, you know, towards this, we again we've been working on trying to get you the best series we can possibly get, so that you you the, you, the information is uh, is useful to you. Um, so there are people I just want uh, to to highlight here, so that if you have questions, if you need uh, further assistance, don't, feel free to reach out to any of these folks out here. Uh, Jane Searles is uh, is in the back of us with the Women Working Community. Um, Brian Mulligan in the back is the uh, governor's account executive. Um, so, if you want to talk to the governor, he uh, sits at his right hand. So, uh, just uh, <laughs> that's what they usually within stomping distance. <laughs> um, Jim Pinio is with the Small Business Administration. Couldn't do all the stuff that we're doing here. And, and you heard uh, even Dan talk about you know SBA loans. We couldn't do uh, a lot of the things that we do 
uh, in business in the state of Maine without the SBA. So we, we sincerely, you know, appreciate all the help that we have. And Jeff Whalen with Eastern Maine Development Corporation. And then, so because I want to hurry up and kind of get this uh, get this uh, going, I'm going without any further ado. Introduce the, your two presenters this morning is uh, Jim McConnell from the University of Maine and Louis Bassano um, again from the for the University of Maine uh, with the Corporate Extension Office. So they're going to be talking to you today about uh, the the really the 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 crux of uh, your business plan is going to be the importance of researching your business to know. Uh, all the ins and outs of it. So, without any further ado, uh, uh, Lou. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As Dave said, my name is Louis Lasano. I'm with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Um, I'm a regional small business educator. Uh, my area is in Hancock, Washington, and Penobscot counties, and I also do uh, work even statewide uh, on occasion. Um, and I've worked uh, for the last 25 or 30 years uh, with many different types of small businesses. Um, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what I do toward the end when we talk about resources. But what I'd like to get started with now is to learn a little bit about who's here. And uh, just uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the type of business you're thinking about. Or if you're in business, the type of business that you're, that you're in. Just so we get a flavor for, uh, for who's here and if, if we can kind of, um, uh, we can have a better feel for uh, being able to address some of the issues that uh, that are related to the type of businesses that you're that you're interested in. So we can kind of start here. Just tell me who you are and what type of business you're thinking about, or what type of business that you're in. I was going to say my name is Nathaniel Gray. This is my son Nathaniel. Okay. And, uh, we have a lawn care business, okay. landscaping, etc. Is that just that's just within this within the Bucksport area? Yeah, or? Bucksport, Cascade. Roma. Okay. You know, right around the okay. 10, 15 mile area. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Sir. My name is Larry Bridges and I uh, I live in Bucksport, but I have a guiding business in Northern Maine. Okay. And uh, I'm a master guide, but I've, I've already, my business, I've been running for years on the side of working from the mill doing loose and whatnot. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Sir. Richard Doyon, and I'm in training to become a medical coder and builder. In the healthcare field. In the healthcare field. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sam? Denise Brown. Um, I actually just closed a business working out of my home. I want to go into the community more and uh, open up. Well, it's changed. I was going to do just a tea shop and a cafe, but um, I know that local markets are becoming a very big deal now, so I want to extend it into a local market. Okay. Great. Great. Sam? My name is Ray Ralston, and I am in the beginning stages of wanting to own and operate a ice cream business in Stockton. Okay. Uh, you talking about a retail store, or you? Um, uh, there's a. It used to be an ice cream shop on Route One mm -hmm. years ago, and I'm in the process of buying <coughs> property and starting my own business. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Sir, Roger Doyle, and that's no work up in mm -hmm. I uh, own and operate Pleasant Point Camps in the Cotton region, eight miles west of North Market. Okay. I want to get some more, uh, better ideas on marketing and so forth. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, John Wambacher, and uh, I own uh, some Al Franklin photography at Bucksport. So, picture frameers and photographers. Okay, great. <coughs> Sir? My name is Tony Gom, and I want to open my own business in a restaurant in the area so that I can work summers and winter in Florida. Wouldn't we all like to, right? <laughs> this winter get me in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my name is Tom Sweet. Uh, I spent uh, most of my life on a mill doing heavy industrial mechanic work. Mm -hmm. I've been stove up several times. In the process of between being stove up, going to physical therapy, and uh, some of my military boot camp, I've developed an exercise routine that is strengthening the backbone, mm -hmm. so I could uh, take most of everybody's aches and pains out of their body. I want to develop that exercise program okay. and uh, show you people how to be so really strong and do the minimum amount of exercise to get the maximum amount of strength in your bodies. I just took karate well, three and a half years ago in February. I tested my brown belt. I still have a herniated disc in my back. Wow. I just tore the ACL in my knee last winter. And I'm still my kicks still up here. Mm -hmm. so, 
and then do the stretches every day. But I just want me to develop that and to help this country out. You know, get everybody strong again. I can't get any stronger than I am right now. I'm 63 years old. And I'll take anybody on at one time. And I cut wood. <laughs> my hobbies, I cut wood all the time. I cut six day cloth of wood in the winter, and I put in a big vegetable garden in the winter, and I'm all out in the summer, and I'm all out the lawns. People can do it. It's just a mind thing, and I want to teach that. And great. Thank you very Nate, much. Nate would like you to step back to mowing lawns. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll give you a start. <laughs> I'm Rob Manor, and I'm from Frankfurt, and I sell paid to contractors, and I want to be better at it. Okay. Well, uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce Jim McConnor, but uh, at the end, we're, I'm going to share some resources that I think could be a benefit to you folks. So, Jim? Great. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's great. Um, welcome to our workshop today. It's titled Know Your Market. Um, my name is Jim McConnor and I'm an Extension Specialist and Professor of Economics here at the University of Maine. And I work all across this great state, putting on educational programs to help um, small business owners, potential small business owners, <coughs> improve their business management practices. That's really my mission in life, is to help uh, people help themselves. I've been working with small business now for it's my 35th year, and prior to that, I managed several businesses. I currently own and operate Wildwood Farm, 50 acre certified American tree farm in, in Orlando, Maine. In fact, we just had a commercial harvest, just of harvesting wood. We, we just harvested uh, 305 quarts um, in about a six week time period. So you should have sold it to the mill. Quite a, quite a thing. <laughs> and we sold it to a variety of places. So, um, but welcome. Yeah. Um, before I get started, let me hand out or have Lewis hand out copies um, of our handouts. I'm going to stand up here because I'm told that I have to, you know be uh, taped and, and audio taped. Um, the purpose of, of the workshop today is <coughs> to help you better understand how to go about researching your market so you can gather the information that you need to, to gather in order to breathe life into your business plan. It takes more than just a, a good idea to be successful in business. You know, you've got to do careful planning, um, management and a lot of hard work. It's important to develop a written plan of action, which is the business plan, which you've heard Dave talk about and, and others, and to investigate all of the factors that you need to consider um, that might affect uh, your small business. So as you develop your business plan, you're going to have to answer a lot of really important questions. Some of those questions you're going to have to ask yourself and get answers to, like, do I have what it takes uh, to be successful in running a business? Not everyone does. Um, but most importantly, you have to ask others. And some of the most important questions that you have to ask and get answers to are related to marketing. For example, who are my customers? How do I reach these customers? What prices will they pay for my products or my services? probably one of the most important, what problem am I solving in my customer base? These are very, very important questions, and the only way that you can get answers to these questions is if you research your market. So during the next hour, hour and a half, I'm going to present to you an overview of some of the, what I call the key elements of market research. So these are some tools, uh, some um, experiences that I'm going to share that kind of will help you understand that if you want to write a business plan that you can implement and be successful, it's got to be based on facts. <coughs> it's got to be based on information that, that is credible, that you gather from out in the marketplace, not just something you think up or hope will happen. I have reviewed a lot of business plans in my life. I've written business plans. The ones that have been most successful or the businesses that have been most successful have been those that have developed plans based on facts. The handout um, that you just received um, includes all of the overheads that you're going to see today. So you can either follow, follow along in the handout or turn your head a little bit to the, to the right, I guess, to, to look at the, uh, the presentation. So let me start by um, giving you a, an overview of what I'm going to talk about today and get started. 
going to start with kind of marketing 101, some basic concepts in marketing. Um, before we get into market research, I'm not sure where everybody is here in terms of a basic understanding of marketing. Some of you have been in business, and I'm sure you've, you've learned. Others may have an idea, but uh, we're going to start from that reference point um, because market research is a very important component of overall marketing. Then I'm going to talk about what I call key elements of, of market research. Um, these are approaches for gathering information uh, from customers or competition or s uh, some other aspects of your market, uh, tools, if you will, that I want to make you aware of, and I'm going to show you some examples of, of how you can implement those tools. I also hope to motivate you, um, because if you're not motivated to do the market research, to, to gather the data to answer the questions, you're not going to do it. Um, I teach a lot of business management classes. Uh, record keeping is one where, um, you know, people will come and listen, but um, the chances of them actually keeping their own records is, is fairly slim unless they're motivated to do so. And so I hope to kind of help motivate market research in the early stage of my presentation. Then we're going to talk about, once I, I share these tools with you and these approaches for gathering information, um, how you can apply some of that to three very important aspects of your business plan. One is developing a customer profile. All of you should have a written description of who your customers are and maybe most importantly who they're not. You can't be all things to all people. You've got to really zero in on who that market is that you uh, has the highest and best um, need for your product or your service. You don't have the time uh, nor the resources to assume that everybody is a customer. Do that homework up front. To do that, to develop that profile, you've got to do some market research and I'm going to show you some examples. Also evaluating the competition. Everybody has competition, whether it's direct competition or indirect. I don't know anybody that has no competition. Yet I've talked to a lot of people who are starting a business and they say, I don't have any competition. By the end of our discussion, I, I point out some examples. Sometimes it's not as obvious. But anything that your customer can substitute for your product or service is competition. And so if you think of it that way, there's a lot of competition out there for the, the consumer's dollar, in particular, your target market's dollar. So what I want to get you to start thinking about, um, particularly with your pitch, is my customers, my target market. I've developed a pricing strategy, not for everybody, but I just developed a pricing strategy for my target market, and here's a description of who that target market is. If you've learned nothing more than that in being able to develop that, that approach, uh, it's going to help you. Focus is really what it's all about. And then finally, estimating market potential. One of the first things that I look at when I look into a business plan is the marketing section. The second thing I look at is the revenue projections. For the first year, how much revenue is this person estimating they're going to bring in? It may be based on the year before, which is pretty good data, but oftentimes, you know, people are starting off, they don't have a point of reference. But there are approaches, there are tools you can use to estimate market potential. I've developed some of them. I've published them. There are places you can go to see uh, where those tools are, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how you can do that. And I have an example of an artisan baker that I worked with, and I helped her estimate market potential for a small community in Maine. And then uh, Lewis is going to share with you some market uh, research websites. I pulled together some links to some sites that have a wide range of data, you know, from population uh, by community um, to uh, articles about different kinds of businesses that can give you some really good insight and information around customers and customer profile and industry um, trends, which is also very important. Okay? So you ready to go? All right, I think I have your attention, that's good. Um, and then we'll take questions uh, at the end. But if you have any questions as I go along, uh, or comments or things to share, that's fine. I've learned over my years that, that you know, I'm not the only uh, person here with, with information to share and, and learning. You know, we can learn kind of from each other. There's a lot of wisdom in this group, and, and so feel free to, to jump in anytime, okay? All right. So let's talk about marketing. What is marketing? When you hear the word marketing, what is it? And don't look in your handout and see what I, how I define it, but just... Selling, yeah, selling your product or your service to the people. 
Anybody else? There's no one definition, but what is it? Sales. Sales. Generating sales. Profit, which is the difference between your revenue and all of your expenses, right? Advertising. Advertising, uh, which I look at. I mean, you can you look at advertising and promotion. Advertising is what you pay for. Promotion is maybe you pay for it with your time. Uh, but advertising, getting the word out, educating the public about what it is you have to offer. You can't just assume because you built it they will come, particularly with a small business. Doesn't mean you have to spend a lot of money uh, or a lot of time, but you have to think about who your target market is, where they get information, and how you can place information about your business in front of them in a way that will encourage them to buy. But advertising, absolutely. How about pricing? Is pricing marketing? Is, it, is that an aspect of marketing? Sure. There's a lot of aspects to marketing, but one definition I like, and it's, it's kind of a, a treetop definition, is one that was given by uh, a gentleman by the name of Jay Levinson, who is the author of Guerrilla Marketing and, and many uh, guerrilla-type um, publications. He's got Guerrilla Advertising, Guerrilla Online Marketing, but his, his first book was Guerrilla Marketing. Uh, what he means by that is, is marketing on a shoestring, marketing for sole proprietors, marketing for micro-businesses, um, for folks that are just starting that don't have a lot of resources to, to spend towards marketing. He's, he lived it, he's been there, done that, and he put together a book called Guerrilla Marketing. And I encourage you, the next time you're at a, at a bookstore or at the library, um, see if they have um, Guerrilla Marketing by, by Jay Levinson. But his definition, his broad definition, is marketing is everything you do to promote your business from the moment you think of the product or the service idea to the point where customers are buying your products or services on a regular basis. So that's a pretty broad definition. So marketing, you can include a lot of things in that. I'm a uh, very practical person. Uh, like I said, I run my own business. I work with many who do. So I like to kind of take a, a, a definition like this and operationalize it. You know, put it on the ground, kind of boots on the ground definition. And here's the definition I want you to think about and, and embrace. And that is that marketing is a process of finding out what your customers want and need and satisfying those wants and needs in a profitable way. If you're running a small business, to be sustainable, you have to generate a profit. You have to generate income over all of your expenses, including the value of your time. And you have to have profit to grow and even sustain yourself. And we, I'm not going to get into this. I'm an economist, so I look at, at profit in two ways. Accounting profit, which probably most of you think about, which is sales minus your expenses. Uh, but there's also economic profit, <clears throat> and economic profit usually is lower than accounting profit because it includes the opportunity cost uh, of, the, of the investment. In other words, if you consider that if you invested that money somewhere else and that return would be higher, you obviously would have to subtract that out, and that's, that's a lower amount. So opportunity cost is an important concept. Um, we'll talk about that um, some other time. So this, mar this particular definition of marketing on the ground means that you focus on producing only what you can sell. So it's customer oriented, customer driven. You don't just produce something and numbers of it and then go try to sell it. It's the other way around. You focus on new opportunities when you use this kind of definition because the idea is it's a process of finding out what your customers want and need. What problems do they have that your product or service is going to help fix or solve? So you're engaged with your customer base in doing this. Your customer determines your production. Or if you're a service business, how many hours and what kind of hours you're going to be putting in to meet their needs. And you use what's called target marketing techniques with this approach. You don't take out broad-based advertising. You do target marketing, which means you first figure out who your customers are and figure out a way in which you can reach those customers in, in a wide range of of ways that fit your, your resource base, okay? Every business um, should have what's called a marketing strategy. You folks are in the landscape uh, lawn and care business, you have marketing strategies. Um, and a marketing strategy is composed of two very important things. The first is your target market. 
These are the people you're trying to attract, you're trying to focus on. And when I work with businesses around developing a profile for their customers, I say, at the very least, describe the demographics of your customers. How old are they? Where do they live? Where do they work? What kind of income range are they in? Whatever descriptors that can set your customers apart from the general population, figure out what those are and use those. If your customers have different lifestyle patterns than the rest of the population, describe those. I worked with a, a company in the Blue Hill area many years ago that wanted to um, move their kayak business or add on to their kayak business inland to Moosehead Lake. And so one of the things that in talking with them about their customer base uh, was that their customers, what they had in common was the love of the outdoors. People that kayak, their customers, that's one thing they liked. And they like to do a lot of things outdoors. And it was a good thing that they knew that because going up to Moosehead Lake, and they wanted to expand and start in the summer, but they wanted to get some data in the winter. So realizing that their customers probably were also skiers, snowboarders, uh, in fact, the younger crowd was part of their demographic, they were able to go and do some surveying at the ski resort up there. They also went to the Chamber of Commerce and learned that they had just commissioned a study of people in town and people that came into town to identify what were some of the things that, that they missed or what were some of the gaps in the market. One was access to Moosehead Lake. So they were able to get data from the chamber, right? And they went and got some data from surveying skiers and were able to put that in their business plan to justify their revenue projections and transition their business up to Moosehead Lake. But by knowing that their customers had certain lifestyle patterns that mattered. It, it, it may be that you're focused on a food product where a, a certain ethnic group uh, enjoys eating them, eating that food. And, uh, or it may be a situation where you have um, a product or service that's, that's focused more on men than women. So figure out ways in which you can define your customer base. And then finally, the expectations. All of you should be able to tell me with your target market, you know, what, what are the key expectations of your business? Do they expect low price? Do they expect high quality? How do they rank those things in their, in their decision set? I worked uh, years ago with the Orono Farmers Market um, and surveyed their customers to find out, you know, what were the expectations of the customers <coughs> of the farmers market? Because the farmers there thought that they were very concerned, the customers, about price. And I was a little shocked by this. This was many years ago. And so the survey found that, that about 75% of, the, of the, cu the customers surveyed uh, felt that they would like to pay more. They're okay with paying more at that farmer's market, 19% more in price. They ranked price like fourth behind quality of product, supporting local farmers, and food safety. So when they gathered that data, the farmers who were working there realized they didn't really know their customers. <laughs> Even though they worked with them and sold products, they didn't engage them. They didn't ask the market research questions they should. And because they now had this information about who their target market was, they were able to alter their pricing and become more profitable as a result of that. So customer expectations with regards to price, quality, service, and, and maybe product service mix matters. And it may be that not every single customer ranks those in the same order, but you should have a pretty general sense about that and how responsive your customers are to changes in any of those things. If your customers are price responsive, then a small decline in your price may result in more revenue, right? If they're not very price responsive and you lower price, you may not get increased revenue, but you may if you raise your price. <laughs> because they, you know, they view your product or service uh, in a different way. They, they value the quality or the experience. And a lot of that has to do, too, with how you brand your product, your business. But knowing your customer is very, very important. And, and the target market's the, the first part of what you need to do in terms of your market strategy. The second is how you communicate with this target market. And you communicate to your target market through a variety of, of variables, a variety of ways, but the most important ones are the product itself, where you sell the product or service, how you sell it, how you promote it, 
your pricing strategies, and then how you position your product in the market. And the whole idea here with marketing is rather simple. You know who your target market is, and you have some control over these variables, right? And you manipulate these variables in such a way that you communicate to your target market in a way that they buy from you on a regular basis. It's pretty simple. That's really what marketing is about. So I wanted to start there. I wanted to start here with a definition of marketing and with an idea of what a marketing strategy is because when you put your pitch together and when you write your business plan in the marketing section, you want to have a section called marketing strategy. And that strategy piece should clearly define who your customer is and how you're going to manipulate some of these variables in the marketing mix so that your customers are going to respond to you better than the, they, they would respond to the competition or anybody else. Okay? All right. So let's talk about the topic of today's workshop, Know Your Market, which is market research. Market research can be as simple as asking a few casual questions, comparing prices, or going to a trade show. The whole intent of market research is to learn as much as you can about your market. And when I say market, I mean your customers, your competition, your suppliers, and factors affecting those particular agents. Market is a, is a fairly broad term, but it means those key um, people or key agents in the, in the system. And it's a, it's a deliberative process where you gather information and you write it down and you make sense out of that and that becomes part of uh, your business plan. By doing market research it's going to help you answer a lot of really important questions like what are some of the long-term trends that are, that are going to affect my business? What are some ones, trends that are happening now? in Maine, some general trends that, that you feel, you think you have to keep track of that's likely to affect your business. Some fundamental changes. How about demographics? What's happening to demographics in, in Maine? Let's say the age of the population. It's getting older. But more importantly, from a, a business standpoint, your potential consumers, your future consumers, are going to be the group right behind the baby boomers. The baby boomers are moving out, moving into retirement, and right behind them is a group of people that are very different as buyers, as consumers, than the baby boomers. And behind them, there's another group, and I'm going to explain that in just a minute, who these groups are, that is even different from the other group I explained. And so it's important to really understand um, how that demographic is likely to affect your business two, three, five years from now. What other long-term trends? Energy costs, taxes. Energy costs and taxes. What are the trends in, the, in those two? They do well. <laughs> <laughs> in their short-term changes, but they gen generally have been going up, right? Energy with scarcity, generally, and, and uh, taxes because of the in Maine anyway because of a variety of factors. Costs yeah. And what other costs that, that could affect your, your customer base? Or what other changes? Tourism. tourism has definitely been on the rise in Maine and the, the, the types of tourism has changed over time. There was a time we didn't have cruise ship tourism in Maine. Now it's significant in the coastal communities and there's ways in which they're trying to to uh, stimulate those tourists to come back to Maine in other parts of the state. <coughs> I know because I've, I've surveyed cruise ship passengers in Portland and in Bangor to assess the economic impact in those regions and what some of the opportunities are for the rest of Maine. Because those are very different people coming in on those ships. They generally have much higher incomes than the land-based tourists. And <coughs> what we found in the surveys that we've done is they generally uh, uh, leave main ports spending less money than they had planned. So we need to do a better job of, of looking at ways in which we can meet their needs. Um, and we have more and more people looking for connecting to the outdoors and can, looking for experiential ways in which they can meaningfully connect with the outdoors. Absolutely. 
What's been happening in food? What, what trends happening in food? Uh, local food. Local food. Yeah. People are, particularly the, this, this group that's coming in behind the baby boomers, are now more zeroed in on uh, the nutritional aspects of what they put in their bodies. And they're demanding changes in the food system. And for those of us like myself who are in the baby boomer population, we're discovering that we may have allergies or issues related to food that we didn't know. I was recently diagnosed with celiac disease, which is a gluten intolerance. Um, and more and more people are as you live longer and continue to consume wheat <coughs> products, there's, a, there's a, a possibility or probability that, that you may find that there's issues related to food. But it is a, it is a movement. It is a, a trend that's happening. And so anyone that's interested or involved with the food needs to be tuned into that, right? And uh, so those are, those are things that market research is going to help you address. Uh, who are my customers? Who are my customers? In order to figure that out, you've got to research your market. You've got to, got to gather data to describe them. What do they want to buy from you? And who are your competitors? You need to identify who they are, um, what they do well, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, and what's your niche? I mean, unless you're meaningfully different than the competition in a way that your target market's willing to pay, then you've got to make pretty substantial changes in your business. Sometimes you do over time because things change. That's the one thing about business is, is one constant is things change all the time. And uh, by doing market research, it at least puts you in a position um, to be able to keep up with those changes. A lot of you that are currently in business, I'm sure, do market research. You just don't call it that. You know, you, in, in order, if you're surviving and, and growing and, and evolving, you're tuned into what's going on. And you look for, for things that can give you at least an idea of, of where you want to make changes now so that you don't hit a bumpy road in the future. No one has a, a crystal ball, but if you're on top of the, of the uh, trends and factors that are going to affect your, the success of your business, you're more likely to be able to, to steer clear of, of those things. I've worked with businesses um, uh, who um, had one supplier for their product and um, they were low cost producers because of the supplier. And when the supplier went out of business or changed their costs, they had a problem. Now they realize that's important uh, to identify and maybe have more than one supplier. Um, so it's just things like that. You know, if your business is very dependent upon uh, or your costs are driven by, you know, few factors, you've got to look for ways in which to be able to diversify and identify ways in which you can, you know, move your business forward. And finally, what is the market potential for your business? If you're thinking of starting a business or expanding, one of the things you really need to get a handle on is, is there a market for this product or service? Um, and what's happening in that market? Is it growing? Is it stagnant? Is it declining? And so all of this, all these questions uh, can be answered by doing market research. Let me share with you just some examples of data that I grabbed from the uh, internet um, to kind of prove my point here. We talked a little bit about demographic trends and what's happening uh, to demographics, but here's a chart that shows percent of the U.S. population uh, in 2015, and this was done um, some years ago when they put this together. But there's um, four what they call cohorts or groups of the population. They have the matures, who are people about 70 years and old in 2015. They have baby boomers, those are people that are 51 to 69. And then the generation right behind it, they're called Generation X. These are people between 35 and 50. And then uh, people of my son's age, millennials, 15 to 34. And take a look at how many people they bring to the market. You know, the baby boomers by far, uh, at least in the last 15, 20 years, had the largest impact, right? 73 or 74 million people uh, in the population, or billion people in the population. 22% um, of the market were baby boomers. And Right behind it is a smaller cohort, but behind them, the millennials, huge, 86. It's, it's huge. And so you've got a situation where, um, as a business, you know, you're, you're, you may have been selling to baby boomers, but you've got to keep in mind that the people moving into the prime spending category 
are the Generation X and then the Millennials. Let me show you an example. Here's a graph that shows the top line is household income. The, the horizontal line is age of the population. So the top line is income, the bottom line is spending. And take a look, where does income peak? Well, it peaks around uh, 38, 39 years of age, and then, and then flattens out, and then starts to fall. And look where spending is. This is spending that would go to businesses. Average spending rises during that time as income rises, flattens out, and declines. That blue area, that's the baby boomer population. <laughs> the group behind it is the X, Generation X. And right at the start of that peak, it's millennials. If you ever have a chance, if you ever see a, a workshop on intergenerational mar uh, marketing and how it can affect business, go to it. Uh, there's more and more people looking at, including myself, looking at ways in which we can educate the business community about this significant change that's going on in the population. Um, sometimes it's happening to people and they don't know what's going on. They, oh, I lost my market, or my market's not where it used to be. That's because their profile was zeroed in on baby boomers and a specific segment of the baby boomers who are now in a place where they're not buying those services anymore or they've reduced their purchases or they've left. And now they're, not, they're trying to reach the group behind them and they're trying to reach that group the same way they reach the baby boomers. I mean, you reach baby boomers you know, by putting ads in newspapers, you know, maybe getting some materials out, posting things on the post board. How do you reach X generation or millennials? Huh? On the computer. On the computer. You've got to go where your customers are <coughs> to connect with them. And so it, I, I've seen it firsthand where a business, all of, you know, within two or three year time period was losing population, losing customers, and it was primarily because of this demographic. And they weren't planning in advance how to shift to that. <coughs> the recession that hit in 2007 and 2008 hit the housing industry hard. Anybody that, that has businesses that connects with the housing industry, new startups or even existing, were impacted. No one knew, no one could predict w when that happened. But once it happened, you're darn right that, that a lot of people really took a look and s to see how it's likely to change my business and made changes. One of the biggest changes was in your industry, the landscape industry, which had been growing by leaps and bounds up to that point. And um, we can talk about that later. But I wanted to just show you, you can gather data to kind of inform you about how this is going to impact you. Growing interest in local foods. You know, we said that, but it's more important to back it up with data. So by going to the census and going to a publication that, that produces this, I was able to gather this data. And you can see tremendous growth from 2006 up to uh, about 2011. It's still growing but it's growing at a slower rate nationally. And this is just one measure, right? This is the number of farmers markets nationally. And farmer market, farmers markets are pretty good uh, barometers for direct-to-consumer sales, right? I mean, you have consumer-supported agriculture, you know, you've got uh, farm stands, but farmers markets is where, you know, most of the direct-to-consumer marketing is. And we all know that it's a fairly small proportion of all sales, right? Four or five percent in Maine. Four or five percent of, of food sales are sold direct to consumers. The rest are through intermediate grocery stores, markets, big box stores. So very small. But but at any rate, this gives you a sense there was rap rapid growth there, but it is it is slowing. So why conduct market research? I mean, how do I motivate you to do this? Um, first thing is it reduces risks of running your business. How does it do that? Does that by helping you identify with facts answers to your questions and alternatives that you may not have thought about. It helps you spot problems in your current market. When you're out there with your market research glasses on, checking things out, asking questions, investigating, going to your competition, you may discover something you ne never thought about. I can tell you how many people we've worked with where once they did this, they realized problems that they hadn't thought of and we're able to make corrections in advance. More importantly, they've identified opportunities that they wouldn't have otherwise. And it's amazing 
It doesn't mean you change your business plan entirely, but you realize that when you first start with a business idea and you develop a business plan that's based on doing market research, it's bound to change from the time you start with the idea to the time you implement. And it's going to change after that because a business plan is something that evolves over time and you work with over time. I'll use an example of myself, my uh, woodlot. We have a, a woodlot management plan, which is a business plan. Inventoried all of the wood that we have on our property. We developed a strategy of what we wanted to do, what our goals were. We wanted to develop paths. We wanted to, to develop walking trails, uh, cross-country skiing, those kinds of things. Um, when we developed that plan initially, we didn't realize that we were going to be impacted by spruce budworm. And if we just went along with when we were going to do our, our select cutting without reference to taking a look at the plan and going out and investigating the woodlot, we wouldn't have caught that we had the, the beginning stages of spruce budworm in certain sections of our woodlot. And if we didn't catch it within five years, that wood would be leaning and on the ground and of no economic value. Fortunately, we caught it. We changed our business plan. Instead of doing our regular harvest, we decided we needed to spend a portion of that time clearing out the spruce budworm that we discovered because it was about a year old or less than a year old to get economic value and also benefit to the rest of the, the woodlot. But it's just kind of an example of how the business plan isn't something you just create, put down, and, and uh, that's all that happens. It's, it's ongoing. It'll also help you develop a successful marketing strategy by doing market research. So let's talk about um, when you should do market research. Well, I think you should do it on an ongoing basis, but definitely if you're starting a new business, you've got to engage in, in researching your market. If you're going to expand into a new market that you're not familiar with, you've got to learn as much as you can about that market and you've got to research it and gather the data. If you develop a new product or a service, you know, you may be in, in business right now and been in business for a while. Um, but as you do your market research, there may be some aspect that you hadn't thought about or you might want to add a, 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 an activity onto your existing business. If you're going to do that, it's important to do a business or do a uh, market research. And updating or developing a business plan, it's essential that you do that. So let's talk about the tools, how you go about doing market research, what are some of the ways you're going to do that. There's two approaches to market research. There's secondary market research, which is gathering information that already exists. You just need to know where it is and how to access it and how to make sense of it. And I'll share with you some examples of that. The other approach is the primary research <coughs> approach, which is gathering information uh, direct from consumers or direct from the market. So it's like doing surveys or you going out and asking questions. So Secondary research is finding out what information is out there, like the demographic information I shared with you, right? I got that from an existing source. You didn't have to create that. You could find that in the library, find that in the census, gather it and look at it. If you're starting a, a landscape business, there may be a landscape today uh, periodical that's at the library that you might go and, and read to give you some ideas about what are some of the trends and changes in landscaping or in the food business. You may be thinking of, you know, I want to cater to the gluten-free market. Is there any information out there that's written about this? You know, why didn't we reinvent the wheel? There may be a lot of good information that's out there. So let's start with secondary market research. So what are some examples of, of where you would go to get that? Obviously, the public library is a tremendous source of information. Librarians look for you to come and ask them questions. And so any question you may have regarding your business, I would go in and talk to your librarian and ask them um, questions regarding um, anything you have, any other any question. They, they may not have the resource right there. We talked about guerrilla marketing and getting a copy of Jay Levinson's uh, book. That could be a place where you go to get that. Or you might want to investigate the census and find out what's happening to the, the uh, distribution of the age in Bucksport's population. Do they, can they give you some information about how to access that information, some tips? And these reference librarians, that's what their job is. You're only 15 miles or 10 miles away from the University of Maine Library, Fogler Library, and Lewis will talk a little bit about how we can help you access 
the resources of that library to do market research. Colleges or universities, cooperative extension, you know, we're connected to a land grant system all over the United States and we're, we have access to market research information that, you know, you may not even thought of, but you, you, you need to ask us or go to a place where you see what's been done and maybe you can use that information. Maybe that will help you. Um, a colleague of mine just finished doing a study of the economic importance of the horticulture industry in New England and they broke out Maine from Vermont, and Connecticut, and, and um, New Hampshire. And the information that's in there shows trends as to what's happening in the horticultural field, the horticultural market. I mentioned we surveyed the farmers markets in Orno. I've got a report on that. I've got all the data that, that uh, could inform you about that. So there may be information that's out there about your customers, about the competition, about factors that are going to affect your business. You just need to, to kind of keep your eyes open and figure out where that information is and how to access it. And we're experts in that. You know, Lewis here, um, that's what he does for a living. I mean, he's really good at identifying where you can go to get information that could help you. State departments, the uh, SBA has a wonderful resource site. They've, they do a lot of research. I do research in self-employment and micro-business. One of the colleagues I've worked with and, and I depend on uh, is a foremost authority in self-employment trends in the United States. And guess where a lot of his research is posted? The SBA website. And there's a lot of information uh, available that you can go and access. There are two publications you should be aware of. One is um, Entrepreneurship Magazine and the other is Inc. Magazine, INC. These are periodicals. And you can access them, on, them online, in many cases in the library. And they often have articles about different types of businesses. Quite a bit of, quite a few of the, these articles are research based. And that information is free. You just go to their website and take a look at their articles. Uh, we've worked with a lot of people that wanted to start businesses and that's one of the first places we sent them. And they found articles about the kind of business they're thinking of starting or they're currently in and they they read the articles from someone that's really doing it and really got some tremendous ideas from that federal and state agencies DECD is another uh, great place to gather and get information Maine Technology Institute there's a lot of organizations state organizations that have information you just need to contact them and ask for that trade associations are another great place Think about the organization or the, the industry that you're in and think, you know, are there regional or national associations that speak to this industry that I'm looking at getting into? We know the specialty food industry really well and there's a national association of specialty food producers. If you go to their website, you'll find a lot of publications and resources available, some for free, some for their members. Um, but that information is, is, is available to people that could be very, very helpful. And your competition. Shop the competition. Get every bit of information you can get from them. Find out what they're doing well, what they're not doing so well in. And there's no sense in duplicating the, the, uh, the wheel there. Figure out a way in which you can fit a niche that um, you know, you, you're adding value to what's already there. So secondary research is just gathering information. These are just some examples of where you could go to get information. One thing that we have at the University of Maine that we subscribe to on an annual basis is called the Maine Business Directory. I'm going to send this around to you. This is a list of every business in the state of Maine. Um, and they gather this data. This is a, a private company uh, called Reference USA. And the beauty of this is it lists every business by type of business then alphabetical order by town. So I, I have people calling me saying, Jim, I want to market my candies to bed and breakfast in Maine. Do you have a list of bed and breakfast by town? Yes, we do. I'm working with a gentleman uh, who's interested in getting involved with hybrid engines and imp implementing those in the boating industry, in the marine industry here in Maine. He asked me, do you have a list of boat dealers? Yes, we do. And the beauty of it is you can get it by town. It also lists the contact person, the owner or the manager, 
and it gives you some data. It gives you a range of employees that they have and the size, the range of income. Jim, is that something you can find online? No. You may find it in the library or you can contact Lewis and we can get you a copy of what's in here. I'm going to pass this around for you to look at. This is, this is about $500 resource. Some libraries have them, some don't, but that would be an example of what you want to look for. There's also the main manufacturing directory. These are a list of, of manufacturers in the state of Maine. You may be interested in buying uh, um, packaging for your, for your products. And you could go to that directory and then they have listings by types of, of, you know, products that they produce. You know, cardboard packaging, glass bottling, um, or what have you. Um, but again, just an example of, of secondary market research, secondary data, okay? And then the internet is another great source, obviously. But you have to be careful. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. Um, what I'm going to share with you, I went <coughs> and pulled together a list of sources for you to go to and start checking out that we'll hand out at the end of the, my presentation. Um, and I've, I've been presenting this for many, many years and have modified it. Um, so these are resource sites that I think all of you will find at least one or two of these sites helpful to you. Okay? I have a question. Now, you, Anytime. You do you have like percentage of success fail, things like that? Uh, that part of that research? Absolutely. Okay. Now, how accurate are the percentage rates and stars? that are published like that, are they fairly I would, well, the ones that I've seen have been. Um, I know in terms of general business populations, in terms of uh, success rates and, and failure rates, um, the, there, there's lots of studies that have been done for different industries, and you'd really have to look at the industry that you're, you're interested in and see if there's a publication that's been done that gives the failure rates and then look at that. I know in general, like if you go to the SBA website, uh, there's overall statistics uh, describing the success rate or failure rate, however you want to look at it, um, overall. But there's also studies that have been done that are online that you can find by sector, which, which would be, I think, the best way to look at it instead of overall. Okay. Here's some other examples of secondary research. I know it's hard for you to see this. But again, I have the link to this that I'm going to hand out. But this is the Census Bureau, what's called State and County Quick Facts website. And so here you can get population estimates, the number of people uh, by age, and you can get this down to, uh, this is the county, town, or zip code. So you can get this for Bucksport. You can get the, the proportion of the population as male, female, by race, uh, you can get a listing of, of businesses, women-owned businesses, male businesses. Um, but a lot of demographics and statistics, it, you know, it varies about how up-to-date it would be, but it's generally, you know, a year or so old. But again, I just took a screenshot of this uh, from the Internet. Census of Agriculture has a, a tremendous website and provides census data uh, for farms, in Maine, uh, the last census was two, 2012, provides a wide range of, of data. Economic Research Service does a lot of different publications. Uh, you see on the left under related topics for the person here or people here that are involved with food, they've got publications, uh, really recent publications on local foods, food access, prices and markets, um, you know, food, sin food industry data. Um, there are economists that work uh, and business specialists that work for ERS and do uh, national and regional studies by different types of industry. So if you go to this website, they have a search engine. You can type in, even type in lawn and garden or landscape, see what you come up with. This is a, a publication that um, Lewis will talk about in a minute, but uh, the Fogler Library at the University of Maine subscribes to this. Very expensive website. It's called Ibis World. What's nice about this is you can get a demographic profile of just about any consumer base in any industry in the United States. So if you're thinking of starting a lawn and garden business, you can get, you can go into this site, you can get a profile of the lawn and garden industry by U.S., and you get descriptive statistics about where the industry was, where it is, and where it's likely to go. Some really 
powerful information that you, you, know, you, you couldn't really get yourself. Um, we've worked with people, I don't know, Lewis, do you have an example of a type of business? Yeah, I worked with uh, someone that was interested in the pet industry. They were interested in developing a, a product for uh, a, a premium product, premium pet product. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know um, what impact the economy had on the purchase, on pet owners purchasing those products. It turns out it's very, it's very heavily related to disposable income. Mm -hmm. As disposable income goes up, people are more likely to spend a lot more money on their pets, and they're, they're willing to pay for premium products uh, for those pets. As disposable income goes down, uh, the purchase purchasing of those products goes down correspondingly. So how did she, how did you learn about this? I just so you were able to go in, go in there and search, and we have a relationship with the um, business reference librarian. Um, who would love uh, to help any of you identify information that could help in your business plan. And Lewis is your connection to that. American Consumers is another uh, online site giving, that can give you demographic information uh, by industry and by sector. And again, I've got the links to these. You don't need to write this down. We're going to hand out the, the links to each of these sites. And you just saw the main business directory that I handed out that I'm hoping to get back. <laughs> it's not one of the prizes. Keep open. All right. I'll stand at the door. Or better yet, I'll Dave stand at the door. Exactly. <laughs> um, and again, it's, it's, um, I can't tell you how often we use this and how valuable it's been to a lot of, a lot of people um, who, who want to identify their market. Sometimes they use it to do their market research. You know, they'll, They'll, whatever their target market is, I'll use the example of bed and breakfast, they'll get on the phone and they'll call some of them and they have a couple of questions they want to ask them, tell them they're, they're kind of doing a survey and do they have a couple of minutes to answer some questions. Some people, you know, don't have the time and hang up, but you'd be surprised. There are quite a few people that, that will talk to you, particularly if you're thinking of starting a local business uh, and you get a directory of local people and say, look, I'm thinking of starting a a, a, a local business, not in competition with you, but, but I, but I want to be able to sell my products or services to some of the people that, that come and stay at your bed and breakfast. My name is Jim McConnell. I live on Wildwood Farm. Would you take a couple of minutes to answer questions? And generally, when you personalize it like that on a, on a basis like that, it really works out well. Uh, another source of information um, I use a lot, um, particularly where for home-based business, is the Maine Department of Transportation they publish uh, traffic counts by location in Maine. I worked with one of the first uh, fireworks dealers um, uh, north of Augusta, and they were interested in um, uh, setting up shop up in the Old Town, Orno area. And uh, to complement their business plan, they needed a traffic count of several exchanges off 95 during certain times of the year. And they went to the, to the uh, website, and they were able to get traffic counts. And then we use that traffic count and some assumptions about what percentage of that traffic would likely stop at their store, how much would they spend on average to estimate revenue. <coughs> farmers stands, farm markets. Can't tell you how many farmers have come and they want to build a market on their farm or farm stand. Well, we look at the roads around their properties. We see if there's been a, a you know, hose dropped off across that road recently. See if there's Department of Transportation traffic counts. Sometimes there, they, there have been, but it's, it's dated. Other times it's done you know, fairly close to, to the time we're looking at. And I can't tell you how useful that data is. Um, you know, they look at their market as being uh, some folks that would come, that th they'd already know about them, would come to the farm and buy from the farm stand. But another part of their market are drive-bys. And if they have a traffic count during certain times of the day, like after work or on weekends, we can use that data and some assumptions about what portion of that traffic they could, they could, they could expect, usually a very small portion, and, or, and then use low, medium, and high. And given the traffic counts that we think we can pull off and what the average person spends at a farmer's market, which we can get to from secondary data, we can estimate roughly a range of revenue that, that they can expect to generate, all from secondary research. You all can do that too for your business, whether it's a restaurant or whether it's a landscape business or, or whether you're involved with uh, uh, you know, guiding. And I've worked with lots of guides as well. 
Here's another example of secondary research. A colleague of mine in Lewis up in Piscataquis County, uh, Donna Coffin, um, uh, published a, a, a results of her survey of people um, around why consumers buy and don't buy uh, direct from farmers. You know, Extension works, one of our areas is the main food system, so we, we kind of accentuate that here a little bit, but we work with all a variety of businesses as well. But this report is research-based information, and generally it's generalizable, um, not just in the, in the Piscataquis County area, but down here as well. So if you're thinking of, of selling products, food products, to local uh, food producers or to customers, you can use this information here to get a sense of your customer profile. I've used information like this when I used to work um, with a person selling pies here in the Bucksport area. She's no longer here, uh, but she was a very, very successful pie seller down by 46 there. Mm. And, um, you know, as she started off, she knew the traffic count, but uh, she wanted to get some, a better idea, uh, particularly in the summertime, the people coming down to, uh, you know, coming through to go to Bar Harbor, or people coming down into Castine. Um, you know, she wanted to get a better sense of, of you know, their, their demographics. And she was able to, we were able to get some data for her that actually helped her position her pies and actually get better prices, to be honest with you. Good location. Good location. Location, location, location is important for a lot of businesses. Yeah. Um, so that's secondary, some examples of secondary research. Um, some examples of primary market research is personal interview. That's where you talk with, with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you talk with your customers, potential customers, and ask them questions. Uh, telephone interview. Um, today's day and age, you know, if the person doesn't know you, you know, people are busy and, and they don't like to be invaded. So usually if you, if you call someone cold, they don't know you or don't know anything about you, chances of, of you being able to ask them questions is pretty slim. But like I said, if, if it's a local situation and um, you can first introduce yourself and, and talk to them a little bit about what you're planning to do, uh, that can work out well. Or if you, you're looking at um, uh, tapping customers that are customers of other businesses, you, know, you can call those businesses and say, look, I'm a guide. I'm in guiding business. I know some of the co my potential customers are likely to be customers of yours. Um, do you have just a minute to, to talk with me a little bit? I have some questions I want to ask. No, they don't mind getting a brochure in the mail, but you call them and stop the time on the phone. <laughs> they don't like it. So you got to be yeah. You got to be sensitive to all of that, and it may not work. May not be be good for your kind of business. I know with all the scams that are going on around the country, I brush off a lot of phone calls. I do too. Yeah. So, so it's. I think that for, for business to business, it generally works better. Like if you're a business and you're calling another business um, for information, particularly if it's, you know, if it's local and they know you and they know you're not calling them to, to compete with them, you're, you're calling them maybe to, to, to do business together, I don't know, but, but it, or you're wanting to do business from them. You may want to be buying their products. It, it generally. Scam business is the business we should be <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that. Start um, calling Russia for a change, you know, so they're calling us. <laughs> but, but, and it depends, it, it depends too, like another way to, to think about the, te the telephone interview and the second one here, the mail interview, the mail survey, um, that could be emailing someone or actually giving them a physical survey to fill out is all of you should be collecting information um, from your customers. You should all have a customer database, right? Over time. You start your business, you may not have anybody now, but over time when people buy products and services from you, you want to keep track of them. You know, you can use your computer, put their name, address, telephone number, and email address. These are people that have purchased from you, have been your customers, and you develop that database. Now think about um, a need to contact them or connect with them. Not just to market something, market something to them, but, but maybe to follow up and to find out how their experience was or what suggestions they have for you. Then you might consider picking up the phone and calling them because they know you. You know, I'm Jim McConnell. You know, you you uh, came out to my farm and cross country skied. Do you have a couple of minutes um, uh, for me to ask you how your experience was? I mean, they may hang up on me, and I certainly wouldn't call it dinner. Um, or I may send them an I you know something through the internet. Um, but I make it very clear um, in the subject line who I am. 
Um, and again, it, you may not get responses from everybody you want, but I think it's really important that we all um, keep track of our customers and, and constantly follow up with them to make sure that not only are we doing the best job possible, um, but we are kind of looking at the opportunity for them to share with other people and help further market your business. If they were happy with what they got from you, then they'll more likely be happy to be around for you. Yeah. And not only that, I think probably the best information you can get from a customer is, is, is information you don't want to hear. Um, and probably the only way you could get that is, um, you know, through a survey where they don't identify themselves. You know, you may talk to a customer one-on-one -on -one and they're going to tell you what you want to hear, uh, but, you know, they're not going to tell you if they had a problem. Who do they tell? Their friends. They tell other people. I mean, that's clearly documented. Um, so another reason for doing this follow-up with a survey, uh, even though I guess you could track them with their computer codes, but um, is for them to give you an opportunity to, to tell you ways in which you can improve your business. And maybe it's how you phrase that question. You know, I really want to improve. What are some things I can do to improve? And uh, some of the best uh, advice that I've gotten and others that I've worked with has been, as I said, advice they, they didn't want to hear. Um, campgrounds, people that run campgrounds um, realize um, how important it is to gather that information. Campgrounds are one of the b t businesses where you've got temporary employees coming in, big turnover employment and employees, and you know the experience of the camper uh, is directly connected to the employment, to the employees and the owner too, depending upon the circumstance. So it's really important. We used to work with the campground industry in a big way. Um, many years ago and, and surveying customers was a really important part of, of retaining customers and um, you know growing the business. Focus group interviews um, are, are a good good option for a lot of people particularly when you're thinking of coming up with a name for your business or you just want feedback from um, you know uh, your product idea um, or even taste testing but you have to be a little bit careful you want to Pick some people that you know aren't going to tell you what you want to hear. I um, mean, I wouldn't generally do it with friends, uh, but maybe friends of friends. Uh, but we've worked with people that have done that and have gotten really useful information. The beauty is you have people interacting with, with each other, and you have the chance of kind of getting a richer body of feedback than you would just by asking one person at a time. So why survey customers? Why, why go to the trouble of keeping a customer database? Um, and going back to them and asking them information. Well, the, the most important thing is to learn about their expectations. And we talked about earlier how price, service, quality are really important expectations that your customers form that you need to know about. And you need to know how they rank them uh, in terms of buying products and services from you. You may be presently surprised or surprised that, that you thought price was really the overriding factor when in fact it wasn't. It was something else. And if you change that something else, that may be a problem. I worked with a, a person down in um, Goldsboro area that, that, that developed a, uh, a, a, a food market for um, summer residents. And he you know, used his own thinking about what he was going to stock in the, in the store. And he was lucky. You know? um, he developed a, a pretty diverse product mix that, that the summer people liked. Um, what he didn't realize was that when some of those products weren't selling and he discontinued them, he lost some customers because of that. Because uh, it was the customer, it was the product mix that these customers liked. So even though they didn't buy a particular item every time they went there, they looked forward to buying it every other time, and that wasn't enough from his viewpoint to to justify carrying the inventory. But if he had just surveyed his customer, if he just even had a, a card there at the, at the checkout counter with a sign saying, please, please, you know, fill out this card and give them an incentive to fill it out, um, he would have learned in advance um, that product mix was very important to his core group. And he, he would have thought first or he would have asked first before he made changes to the product mix. You also need to determine the level of satisfaction of your customers. How satisfied were they with your products or with your service? If you want to develop a solid customer profile, 
you need to, to gather information from your customers. Um, you may start with secondary research, maybe a description of, of the characteristics of people that are in this industry, or customers in this industry. But once you start to, to, to engage with your customers, you need to kind of learn from them as much information as you can without being invasive, but just so you understand who they are. Uh, and that may, may be a personal interview where you're just asking them questions. And also, as I said earlier, to identify areas of improvement. Um, one of the workshops we teach a lot is customer service. And it's a very hard uh, workshop to get uh, retailers to attend because I think a lot of them, well, actually I followed up and found out in a lot of places, they, they feel they already, that's their expertise. They're retailers. They, they work with customers all the time. You know, if there was a problem, they would know about it. But what they don't realize is that most customers don't tell them, their employees or the owners, that there's a problem. They either have a problem that's not satisfied and they leave, so there's a lost opportunity, or they have customers that have a problem and don't buy as much as they would, uh, as they would if the if the problem was solved. Um, and it's in getting areas of improvement, getting that kind of feedback is really important and vital. And surveying is a way to get that. So let me switch now and talk about, we talked about the two approaches to market research. Secondary approach where you gather the information, already exists. Primary market research where you yourself kind of get involved and, and gather information. Let's apply those to three really important uh, components of your business plan. One is to develop a customer profile, which all of you have to have. And when you make your pitch, people are going to be listening for who your customers are. And just don't say, these are people that live in Bucksport, or these are people that live in Bangor, or these are summer people that come in. That's too general. That's not specific enough. Also, evaluating your competition. You should know everything about your competition, as I said earlier. And then estimating market potential. What dollar amount can, is out there in the market? You know, and what proportion of that dollar amount can I expect to, to get in, in my business? Okay? So let's first look at customer profile. When you build a customer profile, um, the first thing I like to, to see in it, or what, you, what I would recommend that you do, is develop the demographic piece of that profile. In other words, what's the typical age of your customers, or age range? of your customers. doesn't mean that all of your customers have to be within that range, but where most of them are going to fall. What's their income level? Household income, for example, or even personal income. An educational level. And I would also add, you know, where do they live? Where do they work? The travel patterns. All that data I just explained, you can get. It's at your fingertips. It's on the internet age, income, and educational level all through the census by zip code. You can get that. Traffic patterns, where people live, where people work, the main department of labor. Write that down. I think I have the, the, the link to it. You can go to the main department of labor for every community and find out the net change in the population that leaves that town to work outside the town and the people outside that town that come into that town to work. Isn't that pretty interesting and da valuable data? It could, it could be very valuable. It is, has been valuable to people. That's all that's available. You don't need to go research it yourself. It's there. Lifestyle patterns. Oh, let's get back. Lifestyle patterns. What is it about how your, your customer base um, lives? And what are some of their attributes that distinguish them from the rest of the population? That would be good for you to describe. Like what are their common interests and beliefs? I mean, maybe you have a product or service that, that you know, is catering to uh, individuals that, um, you know, have certain beliefs about the environment. And so that you want to make sure you position your product or your service such that it appeals to their beliefs. So maybe they, they're consumers of yours, but they, they want, they'll only consume if you have certain environmental practices with your business. That may be the group you want to focus on. It may not be. But if it is, you'd want to be able to gather data about that. 
I mentioned to you behavior patterns with the client I worked with with the kayak business. You know, because this person knew the customer base that the majority of them also like to ski and do other outdoor activities, that led to an opportunity to be able to gather data um, that helps support the business plan. And I'm sure all of you can think to yourselves about how your customers and, and, and what is it that, that's unique about how they behave that, that might help you, um, you know, further your business. And then finally, expectations. What is their expectations regarding quality, service, product mix, and price? At least those four variables. And I would want to know how they rank them. So when I go to a business plan, I look at the marketing section, first thing I want to see is these are the people that I'm trying to attract and sell my products or services to. Here's the description of them. Their, at their age range, their income, where they live, where they work, any other demographics that might make sense to your business that I don't have up here, that, that only you know about, describe that. But I also want to see, in terms of expectation, how do your customers rank, in order of importance, those four variables? Is price the most important? Or quality or product mix? What's the ranking? How do you know that? Well, you can know that if you are able to find some information written about that business from people that are in it where they provide you with a general profile of their customers. You also have a sense as you do your primary research in engaging and talking with some of the customers and you're able to, to you know, talk to them and find out what their ranking and product mix is. It may not be until you're really started and out of the gate. If you're currently in business and have a customer database um, and you interact with your customers, you may already know. You just have that. It's just part of your being. Um, but if you, if you don't have that and good information about that, that's important to have. And it may be that you have a customer base, but that has several <coughs> segments in it. So there may be different characteristics, maybe three or four different segments of the target market that have differences among some of these factors. You know, it's like people that come and shop at a farmer's market, you know, obviously they're, the customers are those that shop at the farmer's market, but there are different um, segments, subsets of that target market to be able to describe, okay? So here's an example um, looking at um, demographic information uh, for individuals that are interested in hot sauces, pork consumers, and frozen pizza uh, consumers. And this is taken straight from um, research that was done. It's online. And the demographic profile on the left shows the gender, uh, male, female, uh, age, income, um, college graduate or not, or what proportion is college graduate and household size. So the first column, or the second column here, is U.S. population. So here you can see the U.S. population, half, 50% of the population is male, 50% is female. Now, if you're going to start a business and market hot sauce, um, and your customer base were people that were looking for hot sauce enthusiasts, the demographic profile is 80% are male, 20% are female. Would that be useful to know? <laughs> yeah. And the average age is 29, which is considerably younger than the average age of the U.S. population. What else do you note about the, the hot sauce enthusiasts? Look at the income level. It's almost twice. 78% are college educated, and their household size is small. So this, I'm just showing you here, for this industry, pulling out secondary data to help describe them on these scales, gender, age, income, how, you can, how this makes sense in terms of helping you define your customers. So that'd be telling you you should be displaying the hot sauce besides the vehicle one. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right, that's good. Let's go to the next one, yeah. <laughs> so next one is pork consumers, very different, you know, uh, mostly female in that group. Um, average age is much higher. Um, under 10% are college educated, fairly high uh, household size. And so 
just knowing this doesn't, you know, it's not the end all, but it gives you a pretty good sense of, of how this particular um, group is unique and different from the rest of the population because you know in starting a business how important it is to focus and really understand this group. Frozen pizza, you know, 90% are female, I mean, by and large. That's where uh, I'll come in. I'll teach them to make their own, own pizza, <laughs> right? Buy it from me. Mm. Um, but again, this is what I'd like you to see you do with your business. You know, on the left-hand side, you know, these are some of the demographic things. But also, we talked about expectations and lifestyle patterns. Think about some factors that that you think is important that distinguish your customers from the rest <coughs> and list those. And then the question is, where can you get some data on it? And that's where you can call Lewis. We may not have the exact answer for you, but, but there are, we, we know of places in which you can go to get that. Um, and see, I just want you to see from this example how if you put yourself in the shoes here and did this for your business, how that could help you. The second area is evaluating the competition. You've got to do it. That's the second thing I look at in a business plan is to make sure that you understand your competition. And unless you're able uh, to brand your business, your product or your service uh, uh, to your target market, not everybody, but to your target market, so you're able to communicate how meaningfully different you are than that group, uh, then it's going to be a hard go for you. And so understanding your competition is important. So you need to list who these competitors are, what customers do they serve, Analyze their strengths and weaknesses, and identify key factors to evaluate. What's what's one of the key factors you'd want to evaluate? Price. Price. But what's the first thing you want to do? You want to know if you share a target market with them. How does your customers rank those important variables? So let's say quality is first. Price is fifth. Doesn't mean you ignore price, but probably the first thing you'd want to get a handle on is is the issue of quality. And when you look at quality, the key thing there is, how do the customers define quality? Not everybody defines quality the same way. Lewis and I worked with a blueberry uh, producer in, outside of Machias that, that is in the fresh market, very high end. When she, her customer base that comes through in um, buses on their way to Canada, they look for a specific type of blueberry, fresh blueberry. They define quality as blueberries, not that are big or small, more blue or less blue. They define quality in terms of lack of stems and debris in the box of blueberries that they purchase. Unless you knew that, that that's what they mean by quality, you could be missing the mark. By her zeroing in on that, she incurs the cost to be able to make sure that each of those blue, the boxes of blueberries, five, ten pound boxes, even smaller, do not have any stems in there. And she markets it that way, educates her customers that way, and guess what? They're willing to pay for it. And as long as you have customers willing to pay for what you offer that's uniquely different, then you can generate a price point that may or may not, but most likely would be profitable. Summarize the key competitive advantages. So for each of your competitors, for those variables that are important, summarize them. Take a look at when you're coming in or in this market, what is it that, that you are better at in those areas? And focus on that. Final thing I want to share today in terms of applying those tools of trade area or, or tools of uh, market research is estimating market potential. That's something that a lot of people just don't have a clue about. And, it, and it's not something that's intuitive or easy to come about. But fortunately, there have been those of us that have given a lot of thought to this and have developed some tools that can help people. One of the tools is threshold analysis that I've developed. So for example, I can give you a general idea of how many people it takes to support a different type of business at the community level. So I know, for example, that if you're going to start a grocery store or a small market, you're going to need a much larger population base to support that than if you were to start a um, uh, appliance store or appliance service center. 
um, there's tools in which we, we develop to kind of estimate that. So in estimating market potential, the goal is to kind of define the market size for your target audience. Not everybody, but for your target audience. You need to estimate the, your market share. What proportion of that market do you expect to, to get? When I work with folks, I like to have them look at kind of, you know, ambitious all the way down to very conservative. So you can do three or four different levels of estimates. Determine the average yearly consumption. Oftentimes, you can find estimates of this through secondary data, through secondary sources. Remember the farmer's market survey we did? One of the things we asked is what the, what the average person spent at the farmer's market. I can tell you uh, by sector in Maine what the average person spends in the building supply sector, in the general merchandise sector, in the specialty store sector, all the way down by town level. So, I mean, you can get average expenditures for a wide range of, of uh, sectors and data points. And estimate the average selling price. Sometimes that's pretty easy. You know, just go to your competition or go to the store and see what that's selling for or what the service is selling for. So let me give you an example. That looks kind of terrible, I know. But mm -hmm. as an economist, I have to put equations or graphs up there. Um, so it, it, what I want you to think about here is that market potential, which is MP, market potential is equal to this is a mathematical expression. <clears throat> the number of potential customers times the percent of, the, of that market you believe you can get times the average selling price times the average consumption per year per person. So if you know how many people are out there are likely to buy your product and what they're likely to spend on average, if you just had those two, you could estimate <coughs> what the average market potential is, right? If you know how much, how many people are out there and what they're spending on average each year, if you multiply the two, that's roughly what you can expect the market to, to generate in sales. And here we're, we're going to adjust that by their uh, average consumption. So I'm going to share an example with you, bring this to real life. So here, pretend you're planning to start an artisan bread business, okay? And you're looking at, at starting a business out of your home, but selling into a town of 10,000 people, okay? Which is what, four times the size of, of Bucksport? Dave, what's the population? Twice the size. Twice the size of Bucksport? Um, without the summer residents, right? We don't have many summer residents, so it's about oh, really? 5,000 population. Okay. Um, but these are, the, so, th so anyway, this is the population base. And you're saying that 10% are potential customers. That's your best estimate. That not everybody's going to buy artisan bread in this community. And, you, and you've done some studies. You've contacted Lewis, and you went up to the library, and you found uh, publications on artisan bread bakery businesses. And you found in those surveys that roughly 10% of the population when they go to shop at grocery stores, supermarkets, whatever, they buy artisan bread. In fact, that data, there's a, there's a, a resource called Supermarket Facts, and in Supermarket Facts, they have data like this. Yeah? I was just curious, on, I was going to ask in the survey portion, how important is, or it might be by industry, but uh, surveys that are conducted uh, from a trade group or national surveys or whatever compared to, you know, like a smaller uh, state survey or county survey, that kind of thing where, I guess, how should you weigh, how, you, how do you weigh a survey as to how much it's really going to affect your market? That's a good question. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, if you have a results from a national survey and you want to apply it to um, a population base um, in a particular town, what I would want to do is take a look at that national survey and look at, at the demographics of the, the population they actually got responses from, um, and then try to look and compare that to the demographic profile of your target market and, and take a look at what the differences are, what the similarities are, and then make, make appropriate scales. Um, we do that a lot with input-output modeling, you know, looking at economic impacts. We have a national model that looks at relationships among industries. And if we scale it down to Maine or to a county, you know, sometimes we have to adjust that scaling factor because it's, 
you know, Maine is much different than that national. Um, so I, I would be kind of cautious in how you would apply that. Likewise, if you had a locally developed survey, I would want to make sure that it was done scientifically and appropriately so that those results are representative of the population, as I would the large national one as well. Um, so a good question. So in this case, we're looking at a town of 10,000. We estimate that 10% are potential customers. So there's 1,000 1, people in that town on average that we feel uh, will, will um, potentially buy artisan bread. Currently, there's three competitors in town, and you're jumping in. Uh, if you're optimistic, you could say uh, you would take 33 or 25%. You'd be the fourth. But instead, you're going to be conservative. You know, you're a new entrant into this business. And you're going to say, I'm assuming I'm going to take 15% of the market, which isn't an equal share, less than an equal share. Okay? You find out, you go to the grocery stores in that region, and you find out, you go to, you go to farmer's markets where they sell artisan bread, and on average, they sell the bread for $4 a loaf. Okay? The average person you find out from the surveys and from other research is the average person these thousand people that buy, they generally buy two loaves per month. Sometimes they may buy five, one month, and none the next. But on average, two loaves per month. Okay? So these are all the variables in that previous equation. Remember I showed you? And so let's estimate the market potential here. We take the thousand customers that are likely to buy artisan bread. We're, we're estimating we're going to get 15% of those. Right? So 150 are going to be people that are going to buy from us. They're going to buy 24 loaves a year, right? Two loaves per month times 12 months. And the average they're going to spend is $4. So that's $14,400 of market potential. So of the 1,000 people in this market, in the portion that I feel that I'm going to be able to, to pull from that market, I can expect around $14,000 a year in sales. Does that mean you, I'm going to get it? No, but I'm estimating this to be that. And I'm putting this in my business plan as a methodology I'm using to estimate that. Wouldn't you want to estimate in like sales? What's that? Stales and stuff into that. Sales? Stales. Oh, oh, stale, right? oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of factors <clears throat> you'd want to include in that. This is just new, new purchases, new sales. And depending, it depends on the nature of the business. You know, in that case, if you're making, this case, we're talking about a fresh artisan bread business where you're making fresh bread, you know, every day, and you're selling that bread, and uh, the price changes may, may vary over time. And let's just say that $4 bread reflects that. It's a weighted average. But, so no matter what your, whatever your business is, you would want to reflect that. One way to do that here would be to, to have a weighted average price. So at any rate, you can see how this is an example of applying that, that data. So um, I have in your handout some lists of market research websites that, that I want you to take a look at. Uh, we also have another handout that Lewis is going to share with you with some more of those. But the final thing I want to share with you is, and it's in your handout, um, these are three um, places where you can go to get um, some of the methodologies that I was telling you about to estimate market potential. A colleague of mine in, in Georgia, um, his name's Kent Wolf, um, has uh, developed a lot of different tools to estimate market potential for different types of businesses. Um, Monday in North Carolina State has done the same. Both of those folks have taken <coughs> some basic tools that I was involved in developing um, some years ago at Iowa State when I was there and some, some tools here at Maine and have uh, uh, added value to that. And then we have a publication online called Estimating R Retail Market Potential. And you can go to that website and, and take a look at some of the, the uh, approaches that um, I've used with business owners to, to kind of come up with an estimate. Sometimes you know, there's an art to it and there's a science. You know, uh, we've worked with restaurateurs. Uh, that wanted to, to buy an existing restaurant, they already had data from the previous restaurant owner to get a sense as to how many lunches they would expect to serve, how many dinners. 
Um, we've worked with people that wanted to build a, a restaurant, had no previous data. And so the approach there was we, we started with, you know, uh, the menus and how many, how many uh, um, people could be accommodated for, you know, if they did breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then we were able to get national data um, and even Maine Restaurant Owners Association data, Association data on how often they would turn it. I was in the restaurant business, so I kind of know the key terms. But, but you could utilize that, grab <coughs> some data on average menus, average price, and then occupancy. And you could estimate um, you know, what the, the lunch revenue is going to be, breakfast revenue, dinner revenue, and then pull that into your business plan and look at a high, medium, low. And that's better than doing what? Guessing. Just guessing, purely guessing. So this is educated guessing. Okay. All right, any questions? Do you have your hand up? Do you have a question? Okay. Good. No. Jeff? Did you use uh, traffic stops in that restaurant example? Uh, traffic patterns in that example? And you were figuring out uh, the new restaurant? It, well, anytime you use traffic, then to me, there's that's one segment of, of the market you're looking at. I mean, very rarely does a, a business rely strictly on, on traffic counts. But I have used them for... Um, particularly for tourist-based uh, or drive-by-based um, data. I did for the firework company, but that wasn't all we used. Um, so sometimes, you know, you've got different segments of the market. You know, you may have a business where during certain times of the year you have a summer population that owns summer homes and you focus, they're part of your market, but they're not there in the fall, they're gone. But in the fall there may be others that come in. And so you, you kind of want to take into account that, that sometimes our markets change um, you know, over time and we need to kind of measure um, those profiles as well. You may have a very different customer profile in the summer than you do in the spring or the fall. Or if you're dealing with industrial customers. I was in the painting business years ago. We started with residential. We ended up with commercial and industrial. And the commercial and industrial markets are very different in the painting business than, than residential. And the first thing we found out is we needed to be bonded, which, you know, we didn't, didn't realize when we first started off. Um, and then when we had to buy equipment and, and uh, scale up to be able to, to, to get business and, and uh, uh, have bids accepted, you know, it was, it was a whole different customer base. So those profiles changed markedly. And even within those profiles, residential, industrial, there are differences among different segments. So I don't want to paint it to be you just have one customer and this is their only profile. Um, but it, it gets you thinking about that, and I think that's important. Okay? All right. Well, that's all I have. And uh, Lewis is going to uh, talk with you a little bit about um, um, how we can help you and support you and, and a little bit about uh, some of the market research sites that we have. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, this market research data. These are excellent websites. Uh, just pass around. <coughs> Uh, these are excellent websites that you can go to to get some of the data that Jim talked about. And um, I want to mention something that Jim did not mention is Extension's online resource library. Uh, I'm going to pass this out as well. I'm going to pick one of these. The library has tons of great information uh, about starting a business and it has information about different business topics, everything from business planning. Uh, down through marketing, uh, financing, uh, also a listing of uh, data centers where you can get the kind of data that Jim's talking about. It's, it's, it's right on Extension's online resource library. Um, we also have fact sheets that can be downloaded on business planning. It's an outline of developing a business plan. One of the things I really like on that website is you can go to uh, several sites that have examples of business plans that have been completed. So if you're looking, if you want to see one that's actually been done uh, and kind of follow that as a guide, you can do that by going onto this website. Um, on this website. Online, yes, extension online. But you'll see, you'll see a lot of links to different places. And uh, one of the links will take you to examples of business plans. And you can even look at different types of business plans. Um, and so it's a really good website to go to. The other thing I want to point out here is that, uh, and emphasize what Jim said, is trade associations have tremendously great information. You'll also find a listing of trade associations on this website, and you can go right to them. 
Um, Jim mentioned demographic data. I can't tell you how much demographic data we've gotten from cl for clients with different various businesses about who purchases the products, how often they purchase. Uh, tremendous information about uh, trends, where the industry, if you, uh, so if you have an association, if you know, if, if you belong to an association, you can get wonderful data. Um, and it's often done by the association in combination with, uh, with a research company. And they provide that to their members. Uh, and if you're not a member, I'll give you an example. The, the National Association of Specialty Food Trade um, combines with Mintel, which is one of the research companies that provides information about the specialty food trade. If you're a member, you can download a report that tells you all about trends in the industry, demographic data. It's wonderful data. It costs, if you're not a member, you can still get it, but it costs you $3,000. To just give an example, so you know it's really worth belonging to a trade association um, because you can get a lot of really proprietary data about your industry that you can use in a business plan, like Jim is, like Jim's talked about. Um, so, um, having said that, um, we also I want to give you, just make you aware of Extension has been also involved with uh, specialty food businesses, as Jim's pointed out a couple of times. We we do the food system is one of our one of our areas. And so we do a program called Recipe to Market. I'm going to pass this out as well. Uh, if you're interested in starting a, a specialty food business, um, we can help. We do uh, a, a six-part six program, five-part program on starting a specialty food business. And so um, we'd be happy to work with anyone uh, you know, involved in that as well. Um, the last thing I want to point out is that I do work a lot with businesses uh, creating, helping them create business plans. I can't write a business plan for you, but I can certainly help you with some of the research data because I have great connections to the, uh, to, the, to the business reference library in the Orno. And so I've worked with a lot of clients looking for the kind of information that Jim has been talking about to put into their business plans. Um, and that's one of the things when I evaluate a business plan, first thing I look at is I want to know, does this person who created this business plan know what they're talking about? And if they've been able to cite information about their industry and their trends in the industry, what's happened, and even the challenges in the industry, that is that really tells me an awful lot about the individual, that they've actually are serious about starting this business because they've gone the extra step to research what's happening in their industry. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this, this business plan has been down for Dave or not, but my wife had to ask me, you know about the cooking business that you just mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Now, can I bring her the next time? Or are we going to have another session? Or she, she, sure. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just want to know. Absolutely. Yes. Sure. Uh, in fact, it's, I'm, I'm going to. Uh, one thing before we pray to you, Jane. I also want to make sure that you understand that I do business counseling on a regular basis in the Hancock County Extension Office, also Penobscot County and Washington County. Um, and so, if you'd like to make an appointment, sit down with me one on one to talk about developing your business plan or identifying some research data, marketing data that you'd like to gather, I can do that. I can, I can sort of work with you one-on-one. -on, -one. Uh, on the back of your sheet, on the back of your, your outline that Jim gave you is the, are the numbers for the different extension offices. You just need to call one of those offices and say, I want to talk to Lewis. I want to set up a business consultation with Lewis uh, and I'll go from there. Uh, so that's all we need. That's and I can sit down with you. There's no charge for this, and I can sit down with you uh, uh, as many times as, as is necessary as you're creating your business plan. It can give you feedback on it as well. Okay. Well, you know, because you heard what I say, I'm trying to develop something that's based on experience. Mm -hmm. My experience to sell. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know how 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 mm -hmm. that thing is developed. You can bring a lot of ideas. You can bring your wife, or you can set up an appointment with me at some point. And we can meet in the Hancock County office uh, if that's the nearest place. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Get him, uh, we can sit down and we can chat more about about it. Um, We're at the courthouse at Oakland, right? Okay. Uh, not the courthouse. We're at Boggy Brook Road. Boggy Brook Road. At Boggy Brook Road. Across from the across from the ball fields. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Those two, we have the recipe to market workshop in Ellsworth too. Yeah, we have a recipe to market workshop coming up. It's called recipe to market. Is it for me? It's a one-day, half-day workshop just to, just to kind of acquaint people with what's involved in the specialty food business. And then if we get a lot of interest, then we will go on and do the full series. 
Uh, and that's, I can't remember the date of that, Jim. Do you remember? I think it's May. Some, some, you can go to the calendar, the bookmark, the bookmark that Lewis handed out. Yes. Okay. If you go to that site, there's a, a business calendar, and that lists the workshops we're teaching and where we're teaching them. One of them is recipe to market. We are doing recipe to market in Ellsworth <coughs> in May. I can't remember the day off, off, the, off the top, but you can get it from the website. It's just okay, I've got to go to the extension office there and pick up my compost. Okay. 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 Well, they can tell you what the date is. They've got it down the calendar. I'm sorry. Uh, I, think yes. I think the majority of people here are from um, this county. Mm -hmm. I'm from Aldo County. Mm -hmm. Are there going to be a series of these sessions that I should be more in tune to in Waldo County? I see you have name and address here, or am I at the right place at the right time? I'm from Stockton Springs, and I want my business to be in Stockton Springs. Um, I can uh, right now. I'm only just covering those three counties, but if you give me a call, we can we will we'll we'll arrange something. Yeah, come to Bangor is probably. Come to Bangor. You can come to Bangor also. Yeah. You can come to me, but you can also you can also come to Bangor. I also do business county in Bangor. It's not just for Penobscot County. So sometimes people Damn. who are going to be who are maybe from another way. area that's, that's outside my area, they make trips to Bangor all the time. And so I can arrange to meet people in Bangor uh, and kind of rearrange my schedule and make sure it kind of corresponds with yours, so we can we can we can meet when you're there as well. So I'm pretty flexible. Yeah. So, okay. I, and I would just add too, because uh, Jeff had stepped out of the out of the room at the time, is that. Um, Eastern Maine Development Corporation covers um, uh, part of Wal Waldo County as well, yeah. and so EMDC can certainly um, you know, can provide some of that uh, those assistance and, and coordinate some of that for you as well. Now, when you were talking about specialty products and helping people to market them, how uh, I guess I, I mean I've got a product here that I've been that I I'd like people to sample here. That's what I brought it for. I have a product that I would like to take and start. I've actually submitted it to a bread company. It's a homemade spinach avocado cheese bread. Mm -hmm. And I've made sandwiches and whatnot for people to try here along with desserts with it. Would you help, is this right here gonna be something yes. that would help me? Absolutely. With that? Absolutely. Along with, you were talking about the hot sauce, which yeah. kind of really triggered my ear. <laughs> I've come up with a, I've also got in there a sample of jelly that goes really well with this. It's a cran blueberry jalapeno. Habaneros and jalapenos together, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, is this something that absolutely? Uh, one of the people that presents, that one of the presenters, uh, is from our uh, food science, is a, is a food scientist, and works a lot with especially food businesses uh, on everything from uh, improving their product to uh, taste testing, marketing, licensing, regulations, all of those things. Um, and so, uh, the <coughs> market covers all those all those topics. Okay, and so be more than happy to. I mean, right now, I'm in because where I'm one of the display store workers from the mill. I'm I'm currently a full-time student at EMCC, oh, okay. and I can't really do anything with this until after I'm out mm -hmm. because of my program. Mm -hmm. So, is it would this be something that two years down the road you'd be able to help me with oh, or yeah. help me with up into a that point? Absolutely, absolutely. Just give okay. me a call. I guess being that said. Do I market my product now for the people? <laughs> I have ham, cheese, turkey sandwiches here with brown, homemade chocolate. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to Dave. Uh, I don't. Uh, it's absolutely. It's my, no it's my choice. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I'd be more than happy to sit down with you at some point and talk to you about. Okay. Uh, that's one of the things I'm, I'm kind of specialized in. <coughs> well, I guess well, I'll be listening while you're talking. I'm going to go set Okay. Okay. Jay, you had a question. I, mean, I, I just had a really quick statement that on the market research website on number eight, if you go to mainbusinessworks.org slash OYO, it will take you to a page where you, if you've never seen a cash flow or wondered what it looks like, you can scroll down, look at the cash flow. It has startup. A, a place where you can put startup numbers in, mm -hmm. and then on the other side, the monthly expenses. And you hit a couple of buttons, and out comes your cash flow. So if you've been nervous about what those look like, it's a really good place to practice. You have to register to mainbusinessworks.org. Again, it costs you nothing to, do, to register. But it's a good practice place. But we're willing to that. charge you twice that much. As <laughs> <laughs> a final comment, I wanted to just say there are lots of resources that are available. Jane is a wonderful example, EMBC. Um, those folks, uh, there's lots of people, SBA, uh, we can all, we're all willing to sit down and one-on-one -on -one and uh, work with you. So, thank you. Thank you.
think that dog from there wants to go to Paradise Point camp because yep. he looks like he's a water dog. <laughs> <laughs> he is that science. Never, <laughs> never seen water in his life, has he? <laughs> he goes to Cape Rozier. <laughs> Any other questions for him, for the speakers? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, Go ahead, Tom. At the University of Maine, like one time, I heard that they had, uh, like, people wanted to have their bias, like, uh, are they able to uh, you have a, a, a thing up there for that? Yeah, a little. The water history department uh, okay. they're involved with that. Okay. So if you talk to Lewis, we can hook you up with that. Because, you know, I don't like your certificate. They always give me the end of the sheet of this. Uh -huh. I'm a bit of that, and that's what they say. Yeah. Yeah. Good thing you, you're helping change that, that uh, statistic. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I think I forgot to mention, there's two extra resources for market, doing market research. Um, and if anybody wants to email me, I can send you these. Um, this is called The Entrepreneur's Guide to Doing Market Research. Um, it's wonderful. It's easy to understand and can point you to all the resources. Uh, many more than even Jim talked about. And this is Successful Business Research, another excellent publication. Um, and so uh, we need to put those down uh, on the PowerPoint, but uh, if you email me, I'd be happy to, to send you uh, these. But they're, they're fairly inexpensive and they're very readable. Um, yep. Yes. Um. I see the um, um, the dates for the all the rest of the meetings. The second meeting, I think, is next week. Correct. And They're every Thursday now. So. It, would be, it would be the only one that I can't make. I think I read it. I'm in Florida. Just a week. But we're we're going to go with you. Oh, uh, Instead, we figured. Read the heat. <laughs> <laughs> Are you paying? Are you paying? Exactly. <laughs> I think I saw in here also where you have to attend all the meetings, which I enjoyed this one today, although I found it slightly off a bit um, overwhelming. But um, um, do I have to? I mean, what happens if I miss next week? Am I going to need it? Yeah, we, we take your middle name away. And, uh, uh, it, it's going to be a lot to miss. No, what, what we're looking at is is that the, the idea is that we wanted to be able to, um, we wanted people to, to engage in the, in the uh, business plan competition. Um, but in order to be able to, uh, to uh, participate in the business plan competition, you have to attend these, these training sessions. But what the, the answer is, is that um, that's one of the things I, I get right notes here that I wanted to, 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 to talk about, is that one of the things I was going to talk about when I first started um, that I failed to, is that the reason, one of the reasons why we're holding uh, these training sessions here is, is it because um, we have the, the ability to be able to record it. Um, so the, uh, the meeting that we're having, t the, the training that you're having today and all of our other training um, that you'll be having during this is that you're all being recorded. So you see all these cameras around here. Um, this, the whole thing is being recorded um, uh, today in, in, in on these sessions. We will be rebroadcasting these on our local access television, um, but we'll also, we're working on being able to uh, upload them and stream, on, stream them on our website. So the answer is, is that we're working, I, I haven't f uh, finalized it yet, but we recognize that there are uh, circumstances that uh, the things like that happen. So what, what we're kind of thinking of is that uh, um, that you might, you know, you're allowed to miss one of them, but you've got to go back and listen and either watch it online or, or if you have access to our local access television in Stockton, you may not have it, but you could go online and be able to watch the one that you missed. Um, so um, the fact is, is that, you know, when you get back from Florida, you could be able to go online and be able to watch the session um, that you, you missed. Okay, and uh, also, um, what about not from this county? Hmm. Am I, um, am I, um, black ball? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're, again, we're working on those. I think that a lot of the things that, what we're, obviously, from an economic development standpoint, what I'm trying to do is encourage you to not only start your businesses, but to start your business in Bucksport. Yeah, well, so, um, but, but I understand. <laughs> but my point is, is that what, so, um, uh, I lost it, my job, too, so I'm trying to yeah, set up my own. Yeah, and I, I, when we respect that. We want you to be included. So the, the point is, is that there are um, uh, certain parts of the the the, the um, uh, awards in this business plan competition. Some of those awards may be specific to a, a business that's located here, yeah. and other parts of it may not be. I so. Think already you're going to be partial to Bucks for 
Uh, well, that's that's not the case because actually we're not we're not the. Uh, I can tell you that as far as the business plan competition, the the judges for this, none of them are from Bucksport, none of them are from Hancock County, um, but they're all these are all uh, uh, individuals who uh, deal. These are uh, they specifically deal with uh, funding, professional funding of of. Uh, uh, you know they're Shark Tank people. Um, this is what they do. They meet with businesses and, and listen. To, you're going to be uh, uh, pitching your business before three judges who do this on a regular basis. Um, look at uh, people go before them to get their money uh, in order to be able to uh, to get them to invest in your business. That's what they do, and they're going to be they're going to ask your questions and they're going to be tough and they're going to be uh, you know. When is that going to be? That's the, on there is the 27th, I think, of May. And so my point is that's going to help you. Um, uh, it's really going to help you uh, in your process of uh, you know of getting these things funded. So the answer is, uh, you know, don't uh, don't count us don't count us out, and we and we're not counting you out. We we want you to participate um, to, to be able to, uh, to 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 participate in all this. So this is new for us. It's the first time we've ever done this, so it's going to be kind of a uh, uh, you know. We're going to be making things, uh, altering things as we go, simply to make things fit because we're learning things as we go forward. We might not know how um, how these things are going to be, how these things are working. I was I'm listening a lot to the businesses this morning, thinking, already thinking, okay, how do we how do we fit this into what we're doing, um, so that, that these folks all gonna you know can can benefit from it because um, you know if. Bucksport has always been a, a uh, has always had the philosophy that a rising tide rises all ships. Um, in other words, you know, if it's when when we're helping all of the area uh, uh, succeed, it's helping all of us. Um, so the, if if a if a business in Stockton or in Orland or in, in uh, Winnipeg or whatever is 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 beneficial, it's benefit it's benefiting all of us. So it, it, we've we've always felt that way, and the uh, and we've always experienced it that way. So I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Sure, Tom. Go ahead. Yeah, they're scheduled from two nine to eleven. Okay, very good. I didn't know the time factor. And uh, so and and again, there are there are, if you know people that you think that that would uh, uh, would be would uh, benefit from this have them come um, you know they may only want to listen to the one on on uh, you know uh, cash flow because it's so riveting and cat you know exciting so uh, <laughs> it, it could <laughs> and uh, right well but there are but there are other businesses yep well, and that's the key. There's, there, are, there are a lot of things that uh, that uh, um, uh, that can benefit. And again, it doesn't. I've got, um, uh, you know, John's have got an existing business here in town um, that uh, you know he didn't work at the mill, but he's here to to, to learn how to. So it doesn't have to be a, a, the the displaced mill worker. It can be anyone. So. Lastly, let me just finish up by saying because we're over our time, but I just want to say a couple of things. One is, what I one of the things that I, I think you learned heard from from both Jim and, and Lewis today is that your business plan doesn't end when you get the business plan finished. I, one of the things that I, I because I work with people creating these business plans every single day, um, and they they're look doing it because they they need to be able to get their financing. So they get this business plan done and they go to the to the bank and they find and they get it uh, funded and then say, okay, now I can go start my business. I'll start. I'll meet with them six months later and say, where are you with your projections that you had in your business plan compared to what your actuals were? Well, I'm not really sure. Well, pull them out. Let's go over this and look at them. Is that that business plan needs to be a living, breathing. Um, uh, uh, Activity that you look at is seeing how you go. I'm using a couple examples here, and I have their permission to use them. But um, uh, Andy from Bookstacks, Andy's always been my poster child when it comes to uh, business plans and 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 success. He's an, an independent book uh, dealer that has a uh, a tough time with it because he's competing with people like Amazon and a lot of other things. But he's doing he's making a uh, a profit, and he's uh, he's able to run a, a business. 
But I can, I can guarantee you one thing. I can go into Andy on the fifth of every month, and I'll ask him, you know, how was last month's sales? And 100% of the time, he'll tell me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm six and a half percent up from last month, uh, and uh, uh, this March was, I've been in business 16 years, this was my 13th best March, or whatever. I mean, he, he knows it all, and he runs it, he, every month he's running his numbers to know exactly where he's at, so he knows where he needs to be able, and be able to be. So, as you again, a business plan is, is something that has to be a living, breathing part of your business that has to keep evolving um, as the uh, as the 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 the, uh, the business moves forward, uh, Steve Crossan, many of you may know, um, with his uh, motorcycle uh, facility on Route 46, I helped Steve write his business plan um, for his for his business. Um, he called it his sleep aid, and I, at the first time I thought he was talking about how boring it was, but when he was explaining it off to someone, he said. Uh, my business plan allows me to sleep at night because his business is a, is a se seasonal business. He started it in his he started the business in October, uh, and and so in a very short period of time, his business dropped off for the season. Um, and he, he but what he learned was in his business plan we had already factored in the fact that it's sort of like a camp I call it a campground um, uh, mentality is you've got to make a lot of money in a short period of time in order to be able to or, or summer summer camps you got to make money during you know you got to make hay when you know when it's uh, when the sun's shining so uh, what he learned was is that I need to have this much money in my account when that business starts going down towards the end of uh, you know in, in November and when he looked at his books and he said, geez, I've got more than enough in there um, than, than I need to, he said, I was able to sleep at night because I was able to, f I, I knew that I was good to carry me through until the business started coming up uh, again. So those are the, I, I can't emphasize enough how important that the business plan is. It's not a one-time thing. It's a living, breathing document that, that will evolve uh, along it. In his business plan, we factored in this is how many hours uh, that uh, of of uh, this is how much money he was going to be able to make revenues he was going to have from um, actual labor and repairs and this is how much he was going to have from sales after about and I still keep asking him about it uh, after his first year full year in business um, I, I asked him how things worked and he says our labor side was was spot on I was able to um, I had a big argument with him because I only wanted him to be able to to, to, to budget out at four hours a day um, for billable hours. Um, because he's got, you know, he was a single, single uh, uh, employee business, and I said you're not going to be able to bill out, you know, eight hours a day because you get time to, you know, you know, schedule motorcycles and order parts and all this other stuff. I said factor in for four hours a day. He says we were dead on. What I was able to be able to bill was exactly what we did. But he says we way underestimated parts. I never thought that the, the aftermarket parts were going to be as high as it is. We probably did 200% more than what I had projected. So he altered his business plan. So when we went into year two, he was able to, to, to uh, affect that and, and then see where we were going. So that's what I'm saying is, is that the business plan has to be, it kind of has to evolve and, and take on a, a life and a breath of its own. Um, but there's, it, dealing with the, the, this industry, thing that we were talking about today, Steve's a, one of the examples I wanted to use that I was thinking about as, as we were talking about sources. He wanted to figure out how, how many businesses, how many people, what's my customer base, you know? And so who's your customer? You know, someone who owns a Harley Davidson because that's what he works on. Um, so I was able to, have in my former life, um, I was able to, uh, I had contacts in the Secretary of State's office so I could go into DMV and said, and find out, said, can you tell me how many Harley Davidsons are registered in, in the state of Maine? I have a number. How many Harley Davidsons are, are registered in Waldo County, Hancock <coughs> County, and Penobscot County uh, individually? We had those numbers. We affected, we, 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 we looked at it. Okay, how many uh, Harley Davidson dealers or uh, repair facilities are there in that area? So we could look at what are my potential customers, and uh, and what are uh, what piece what what part of uh, or what percentage of that market share can I be able to claim? Uh, those are things that when you're starting to look at a business plan, people every single person that comes in and talks to me and says, "Well, geez, that's just a wild ass guess. How the hell do I know how many I'm going to have?" And I said, "The difference is is it's an educated wild ass guess." And when a when a uh, 
when a funder is looking at your business plan, one of the very first pages that they're going to go to on, in, your, uh, in your business plan is your assumptions page. What assumptions were you using when you came up with these numbers? When you saw that, uh, that uh, uh, algorithm <laughs> that uh, you're know, looking for profit uh, or for uh, market share, uh, you know, that's the thing that a, a, a banker or, or your funder is going to be looking at is, is that how did you come up with these numbers? What, what methodology did you use and do, that, do they make sense? Bankers are not experts in lawn care. They're not experts in photography, but they're, they're there to, to, to lend funds. So the business plan has to be written in, in a way so that a, a banker can understand it. The normal person uh, don't write your business plan in such legal uh, in, in uh, complex language um, so that the average person can't understand it. Um, I don't want to I don't know enough about photography it's a point and shoot to me so um, but the point is is that if you get too technical in it uh, it's hard for the the funder to be able to you know to keep it in mind so keep that information basic um, but put it in if you're by putting all those assumptions in there uh, in a way that people can understand it um, you, you're gonna ha it's gonna increase it's gonna help your uh, your uh, um, it'll help them with it uh, what I usually tell people Absolutely. If somebody looks at that, and you can pretty, you can pretty easily, quickly tell if someone's just pulling numbers out of a hat versus right. they've actually done the research that you're talking about and actually identifies the sources and the assumptions that are underlying those numbers. Well, we'll and you'll get when the financing side of it, um, we'll get into a lot more detail on this. Is what drives me nuts is that when someone will look at us and say, well, it cost me this much money, I'm just going to, uh, my insurance is going to be, uh, um, you know, uh, $1,200 a year, um, but I'm just going to divide it by 12 and put it into my, into my cash flow as, you know, that's what it is per month. Even though I'm paying it twice a year, um, uh, you're going to learn about how, how uh, cash flow is king and you can have a business that may be profitable, but it, you fail because of cash flow. Um, so you're going to learn, like I said, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that on the time, but that's, it's the same thing as with these statistics that you use. When in Steve's business plan, we were able to show exactly how, according to the, you know, to the Department of uh, uh, Motor Vehicle in the state of Maine, this is how many Harley Davidsons are registered here. That's someone that you can, you can understand, you can, it, that passes that straight face test. I, I think I can get, you know, two and a half percent of those, and here's why I think I can get that. Again, it's conservative in numbers, and it's numbers that anyone looking at this, as Lewis says, if anyone that looks at this said, okay, that, that makes sense. That's the straight face test. Um, the, the last example I wanted to use to you, uh, I think, because I, this is the fun part of my job, um, is that uh, working with people on business plans, because I learn a lot about industries. I know more about septage dewatering than I should ever have to know, uh, because I write a business plan on it. But the point is, is that um, the other one was, uh, you, many of you know Linwood Bridges, and Linwood has a, a laser engraving business. I wrote, helped him write his business plan for, for his business, because he was laser engraving monuments. Um, and when I asked him the question is, is that uh, he wanted to be able to reach out to other engravers and uh, uh, monument companies and do the laser engraving for them, I said how much of their business um, is, is a specialty um, type of engraving that you'd use a laser engraver for? Uh, and he said, well, I'm not really sure. And I said, well, let's figure it out. So what do you do? I, you know, I called Mitchell and Tweedy. And said, "How do I know? If you got a list of all of the monument companies in the in the state, I learned that in the in the uh, uh, funeral home business, they have what's called a green book. And in the green book, it's um, we've all heard about the blue book, you know, and, and yellow books and all these other things. Well, in the funeral industry, they have a green book. And in the green book, it's a a list of every service that a that a funeral home would need, <laughs> um, and who all of the people are in that industry in the entire state of Maine." So they, he actually gave me, uh, Ed gave me one of his, his old ones because they come out every year. So he gave me his old one and I gave it to, to Linwood, said, Linwood, call every one of these companies in the state of Maine and find out from them how many, uh, uh, how many, uh, uh, how much of their, of their uh, business is specialty stones. Uh, he did that, called every single one of them and he came back and he was just proud as a peacock and he said, um, it was pretty cool. He said, that was actually kind of fun. He said, I learned that almost universally they were all spending about 20% of their business um, was for specialty stones. 
um, the, all of their income uh, from stone sales, about 20% of them people wanted specialty stones. Um, so we were able to use that number in order to be able to work towards these making an educated wild ass gas. Um, so uh, that's the key, as I said, he kind of came out of this and said, well, this is, I learned more about my industry today than I knew yesterday um, because I'm doing this research. So uh, paramount to, to getting, this, uh, getting this done um, really is, uh, um, uh, you know, being able to, to research your industry and, and remember that, they said, that business plan never ends. You need to be con con uh, consistently and continuously <coughs> talking with your customers and finding out uh, and validating, validating what it is that you're doing. Some of the things that you're doing, you simply want to know um, that I'm, am, I, am I doing it right? Uh, and uh, one of the things that I've asked the bu businesses in Bucksport, the retail businesses in Bucksport, I went, when I've been meeting with them and finding out different things that they do, one of the questions I ask is, how do you track your customer? Um, you know, sometimes when you go into a store and they'll say, oh, can I have your phone number? Or, you know, can I have, uh, and a, when you're 56 years old and a 22-year-old girl asks me for my phone number, I'm excited to give it to her. So, um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that those ones I get a little leery about when I'm a customer going into these places asking him. But the reason why they're asking that, can you give me your zip code? Uh, in the summertime here is a popular one is the last year, can you, you know, may I have your zip code, please? They want to know, are you coming from Ohio or are you coming from, you know, Belfast? And you want to be able to know that kind of stuff because you want to know how the best do I, you know, who am I serving, how best do I serve them? Uh, who do I want to market to um, by getting that information? So those are the kind of things now when I, when, I, uh, when I buy something and they're asking me that information, I'm kind of happy to be able to give it to them because I'm happy that they're asking for this to learning. What I learned in Bucksport was that there are only two businesses in the entire town that had the, cap the capability of capturing somebody's um, zip code for a sales because they all, most of the business, the small businesses, they go to Home Depot or Sam's Club and they buy a, a cash register and it's, you know, your basic cash register, cash register and they don't have the ability uh, to be able to electronically do things as you're, you're in sales. So at your, with your point of sale system, um, uh, there were, we only had two, two businesses in town, um, Hannaford and the hardware store were the only two facilities, Jerry's hardware store were the only two facilities that had the, the system available in order to be able to track their customers. Um, so, th so I talked with these, the, the businesses saying how important it is and we've got to figure out a better way and if we can't do it that way, how do we make a, 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 a more affordable mousetrap so that we can uh, capture that information so that you can use it because you need to know where in fact your customers are from. Andy again, love him dearly. When I asked him, I said, where are your customers coming from? He says, well, um, right from this area. And I said, how do you know? I said, how many people come in every day that you know? He said, 50%. We all like 50% number. He said, oh, probably 50%. I said, where are the other 50? If you don't know them, how do you know where they're coming from? He says, well, I guess I really don't. <coughs> Um, so those are the kind of things that, again, you need to be looking at on a, on a, a constant basis. So you'll hear me, uh, uh, you know, uh, ranting on this, t you know, time and again that it's important that the that this business plan be a living document that you continue to, to grow as the business goes forward. Lastly, I, I want to thank uh, Seaboard Federal Credit Union for for sponsoring this event today. Again, um, without those, many of you still are probably members. So. Uh, that uh, without them, you know, we wouldn't be able to put on these these types of events. Thank the the other folks for for helping us again today. Um, and yes, ma'am. Are these meetings going to teach us how to keep two sets of books? No, yeah, you're going to keep two sets of books, but they're going to there's good. You can. I I always tell people I can I can easily show you a fast way to do um, two 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 books, um, carbon copies. Carbon copy. Put a carbon copy in it. When you're writing it out, you'll have two copies. Uh, it's the best way to be able to, you know, to be able to do that. So that's the old-fashioned way. So there, there. As I said, there, there's food and coffee and, and stuff out there. Please feel free to grab that on the way out. If you have questions, uh, feel free to email me, call me, and and uh, and I.